Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Clearwater County regular meeting for April 9th, 2024. I'm just bringing up my disclosure. Uh, all public meetings are live streamed and recorded. Any verbal or written information provided may be included in public documents as per the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, FOIP 41. So I'll call the meeting in order at 9 o'clock. We have an uh, agenda before us, looking for adoption of the agenda. Councillor Graham, all those in favour? And that's carried, thank you. Uh, the minutes of the regular meeting on 3.1 of March 26, 2024. Any errors or omissions? Um, thank you, Deputy Reef Melhoff. Move to adopt a uh, motion. Uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. And looking into the next section is our delegation section. And we have a delegation here this morning with uh, Rocky Mountain House Forest Area. And uh, before we begin, I'll just do a quick round of introductions, please. Good morning, I'm Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division Two. Uh, good morning, Daryl Lougheed, Councillor, Division Three. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, uh, Councillor for Division One and Deputy Reef. Good morning, Michelle Swanson, Division Seven and Reef. Good morning, Jordan Northcott, Division Four, Councillor. Welcome, Neil Ratcliffe, Division Five, Councillor. Good morning, Brian Cermak, Councillor for Division 6. <laughs> Good morning, Murray Hagen, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Rick Emmons, CEO. I guess, yes, I should introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, Kevin Hunts, I'm the Wildfire Prevention Officer here for the Rocky Mountain House Forest Area. And good morning, uh, Kevin Gagne, the Area Manager at uh, Rocky Mountain House Forest Area. And welcome. Yep. And so with that, I will turn the floor over and you guys can uh, go proceed with your presentation. Sure, thanks very much. Um, I was going to introduce Kevin. He already did that. Kevin okay. is our replacement for Chris Hemrick that uh, went over to Clearwater Regional uh, some time ago. And, uh, you know, taller, better looking. But, you know, we miss Chris too. So. Um, He's not even here to hear it. Yeah, I know. Well, I'll tell him later. Oh, okay. um, we got a meeting with... Uh, Christine's folks last week about some of our fire season preparation and thought it would be a good idea just to pop into council. I don't want to take a lot of your time, but we'll take 10, 15 minutes just to run through some of the things you might have heard in the media, the minister say, and just what it means for our area here. Okay. Um, so just a quick recap on uh, 2023, <clears throat> excuse me, provincially, we had 1,088 fires, about 2.2 million hectares burned. Um, in Rocky Mountain House, we had 81 fires, total of about 121,000 hectares. Um, the five-year average for the province is about 200,000 hectares. So we're about 10 times the five-year average this season. Obviously we can't do that. We, we don't know what the impacts are gonna be the industry yet, the timber industry, but there's bound to be some. So the, um, our companies here, West Fraser Warehouse are both kicking off management plans now. So about a year from now, probably they'll have a better idea what, what the impacts have been to their operations. Uh, the causes, provincially, 61% were human caused, 35% were lightning. We did a little bit better in Rocky Mountain House, 57% were human caused, and 43% were lightning. So, and the provincial ones don't add up to 100 because they're not all investigated yet. So, um, uh, You probably heard the minister talk about a few things. I just want to run through some of his, what he's calling operational advancements, things he saw, and, and he was, he's, he's been very involved more than any minister we've seen for a while. He'll grab a map and he'll drive out to a fire himself. So uh, we're not used to that. Uh, it's taken some adjustments, um, but it, it can be really good as well. Um, some of the things he saw, you know, the, the volunteers, um, we didn't end up, they weren't actual true volunteers, they were paid, but the people stuck their hand up and said, yeah, we'll come help. Um, we, he wants to continue that program and that's both Government of Alberta volunteers and, and off the street volunteers. We have a name for them. Uh, Spontaneous citizens, I think, or yeah. something like that. Um, so we are developing a program because that obviously is going to require some training, um, some payment mechanisms, things like that. So we haven't finalized that, but working towards that. The minister is keen on overnight response. So we've, we had one night vision helicopter we tried last year. It was really good. Its range was limited and uh, we can't have aircraft up without dispatchers in the office. So we had to adjust to that to have people in the office all 24 hours. Um, but we've added two more night vision helicopters this year, so we'll have three scattered across the province. 
one of the thoughts is they can work with extra equipment groups or people on the ground. We did do some night firefighting with our unit crew this year. Um, there was a couple times they weren't that comfortable. The smoke settles in the evening, they can't, visibility zero. So we do have to sort through some of those kind of things too. Uh, prepared by April 15th, I think the minister was on CBC saying we'll have all our staff on by April 15th. And saying that he knows we won't because uh, a lot of our staff are students in the university. So, um, but we're going to have as many as possible and I think we should, we should be 50 to 60% I believe of our, all our seasonal staff on by next Monday. Um, heavy equipment, dozer bosses, incident management teams is a priority of his. Uh, we ran out of, we had heavy equipment, but we had no dozer bosses, so we can't use the heavy equipment in that case. So we trained a bunch of dozer bosses mid-season, that's a priority of his as well. Uh, the incident management teams we imported from all over the place last year. I think we had some from, we had firefighters or staff from Chile, South Africa, South Africa um, the US of course, Australia, New Zealand. Um, they came, France was even, well they came to, they went to Quebec, okay, they didn't come here, but they were all over the place, so. We imported all kinds of resources. Uh, the minister has um, gone to Treasury Board and got some additional staff so that we can start building our capacity back up in our incident management teams, but that is gonna be a, probably a five-year program before we really see the impact of that. Uh, communications with stakeholders, indigenous groups, and political leaders. Um, you know, the, again, because of the, uh, not, not just the numbers of fires, but where they were last year and the communities burnt, um, politicians were, really um, really needed information fast and current and often. So we have to um, strengthen our, our information flow both to the city and to some of our stakeholders. Uh, the community fire guard program, I believe the council probably seen a letter about that from the minister. I don't know a lot about it. That's kind of Kevin's area. If you have questions about that. Um, the contract and payment process, that's purely internal, but there were, there were uh, instances where that was uh, impeding us last year as well. Uh, payment for emergency firefighters, it, it seems silly, but we've always paid our emergency firefighters just with a check when they leave. Um, but now uh, the CRA has said we have to take the deductions off. So again, we're not set up for that. So that's something we have to do. Um, the training, delivery and effectiveness. So just, we're, you know, we, during COVID we went to a lot of online training not convinced that's the most effective way of doing it. So we have to sort through what we can do online, what we can't do online, what needs to be hands-on, and just to make sure that it's um, the training programs that we need. And then a wildfire mitigation strategy is being developed, and that was his final uh, operational advancement. And I don't know a lot about that. There are some folks downtown working on that. It's a, it's a provincial strategy. <clears throat> so just uh, further to that, in Rocky Mountain House, um, we haven't added to our hack program. Hack is our initial attack, so the first guys in the helicopter get the fires when they're small. Um, we haven't added staff, but we've extended the season, so they'll be on earlier in the season and later in the fall. Um, our fire attack contract crews, that's predominantly indigenous crews. Um, they, they are eight-man crews. We have four crews that we guarantee 93 days. We've extended those to 123 days, those contracts, and we've added two new crews of uh, 93 days, so we'll have six crews total. Uh, and then those crews put together, I don't remember how many last year, but they have the ability to put together what we call secondary crews, so they can round up more people and send them out. Um, sometimes the training is not as good, our base crews are really top-notch crews, and sometimes when you get to 40, 50 secondary crews, mm -hmm. it's, it, the training is not as good. Um, the extended seasons for our unit crew, so we have, like the hack program, the unit crews are 20-man sustained action crew. So they have, we're getting more of them on earlier in April again and keeping them later in the fall again. Uh, we have one new loader at the air tanker base. So we have the ability to load two planes at a time with the equipment. We haven't had the staff to do that in the past. So by adding a loader, we can do that. It's not very often we would need to run both pits, but it would have come in handy this past season. Um, and we have had one new dispatcher to accommodate the night vision machines. So uh, just because they have to be, somebody has to be in the fire center when they're up in the air. In terms of permanent positions, we have been approved for four new forest officers, um, one logistics coordinator and one information coordinator. So that's, that's great for us. We've been, it seems like the positions have been tailing off since, since I took over in 2013, but 
it's uh, the first time we've really had a bump back up in staff, so that, that's nice. Uh, provincially, you've probably heard about 100 new firefighters. So those are configured in five unit crews, which are the sustained action crews again. They're scattered across the province. Um, what do we have? There's a, uh, some people in the administration section downtown. Um, the finance this year was a real challenge, as you might expect, trying to figure out what we have left to spend or how much we overspent. Um, some fire behavior specialists, a couple of those downtown, a couple in the weather section downtown. Um, and the HTC, the training center in Hinton has a couple staff as well. So um, I believe that, I think it's public now that uh, we were gonna order five new skimmers, air tankers, the CL 515s, but that's not till, I think it's 2030 before they're expected to be delivered. So that's a while yet. Um, and I think the final note I had is um, you can probably expect us to be a little more aggressive on the fire bans. Um, you know, Partly for political reasons, I think there's just a lot of nervousness about after last season. And now, you know, we want to hope that we can maintain control in, in the areas of the fire bans instead of having somebody tell us what we're putting on. So that's, um, by saying that though, we're probably going to have to be a little more aggressive and we'll be talking to Christine whenever we're, whenever we're doing that. And usually uh, Clearwater County at least follows suit with whatever we put on. So um, if there's issues, let us know. That's about all I had. Anything bad, Jeff? Be available for questions. Okay. Yes, yeah, so if there's questions, we're we're here for a while, but uh, we'll okay. free up your day if there's none. No, I, I, I'm sh I'm <laughs> lights lights are coming, so that that's all good. So, and uh, thank you for that update and that reiteration of what uh, the announcements that we've had the last few weeks. So with that and uh, going forward, so uh, lights on first. So uh, Deputy Reeve, uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, an ounce of pre prevention is worth a pound of, of, of action, right? So uh, what are we doing with the FRIA and the fire guards and everything within the Norde community considered it was, considering it was listed as the number one community for uh, wildfire concerns by the University of Alberta? So what are we doing in particular for the community of Norde? Yeah, so uh, we've worked on a number of projects around the community over the last few years with FireSmart to implement the strategies and tactics that are advised through FireSmart. Can, um, can, sorry, they, can I interrupt? Can you just put oh, your mic towards you? Just, just, yeah, I'll sorry, it's closer. just, it's yeah, there we go. No that works so good. Absolutely. So, thank so you. Uh, FireSmart has been worked on through a number of projects in Nordeg over the last number of years. Um, you are right, it is identified as one of the higher risk communities for the province and the letter did come out from the minister advising that. Um, the plan was put into place for uh, this round of FRIA funding, which was the Community Fire Guard Program, uh, $5 million for planning to go forward. And uh, it actually closes, I believe, on the 12th. So there is an expectation for communities that were interested to go forward with putting in a plan for that fire guard. Once the planning's in place, uh, money will be set aside uh, at a later point once the plans are reviewed and approved to go ahead with the implementation of that for those communities that get identified and have plans in place for them. So. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I think ahead. Christine wanted yeah. to. Go ahead, Ms. Hager. Oh, sorry. You bet. Thank you, Reeve. Good morning, Council. I uh, just wanted to add the um, a little bit more background on the Clarida County's uh, component of that um, related to Nordic specifically to answer that question. Uh, Clearwater County staff as well as wildfire staff and it was Wade Coldwell from your office met with um, members from the Norday Community Association earlier in the year kind of talking about some fire smart planning that's going to take place for that um, and the expectation is that um, wildfire was going to be working on an overall fire smart plan for Norday that we expect by summertime you know of course uh, season fires wildfire season permitting if if the work can be done uh, between now and then so we're kind of waiting on that for a, a broader plan uh, we do have some internal um, plans for some of the county-owned lands to do a, a cleanup pro project just to get some, some stuff started in 2024 with our own resources. And um, we'll be applying for whatever fire smart grants and guard grants are available um, at the recommendation of our colleagues to my left. Excellent. Thank you thank so you. much. Some yeah. elementary, if you don't mind. Okay. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Reeve. Um, on the same path of, of prevention, we've opened up our land use bylaw. Um, is there any suggestions that you have for us to put into the land use bylaw? An example being in BC, they, they've suggested that you pre-sprinkler, um, there's some communities in BC that are pre-sprinklering homes as part of their land use bylaw. Um, do you have any suggestions to uh, add to our land use bylaw since it's open? 
I may have to get back to you on a suggestion for that. Um, I, I know that there are communities that have looked at the implementation of sprinklers or having suggestion for landowners to have sprinklers on buildings of their own. The problem with that though is if, if you have a number of different varieties of sprinklers and things, it becomes maybe difficult for a fire department to actually set up and hook up to that. Um, the other issue and concern could be that you draw down on your water resources if a person turns that on and departs from their home prior to a fire advancing towards the community it could be an issue. So, um, but there, there are certainly a number of options that could be looked at and I could bring something back to you. That'd be great, thank you. All right. Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Eve. Uh, just continuing on that question, um, how effective have those sprinklers proven to be? So uh, the idea of sprinklers, um, they're, they're more for an opportunity to raise the relative humidity around the building or facility that you're trying to protect. So um, if the sprinkler can be turned on in advance of a wildfire front coming towards a community or a building, there is an opportunity for you to be able to get it pre-soaked and have uh, a reduced risk of fire um, actually impacting the, the facility or building. Um, it is probably the most effective way rather than putting somebody in front of the fire front coming towards that facility building. Um, but again, it really depends on if you have the water available to um, augment a system like that. Uh, a neighborhood, you're going to draw down your water resources that might be needed for fire response, um, meaning a house that actually catches on fire by doing that. Um, but it does provide at least a, um, a reduction in overall risk to that building or facility because it has risen the RH around that rather than suppressing any fire that might come to the building itself. So given adequate water, um, that's a recommended practice, would you say? It's actually a practice that we employ, especially when we have fires coming towards communities, we will get out in front of them with sprinklers to be able to provide a barrier of protection for buildings or facilities that may have a fire that runs towards them. Um, again, it, it has to be implemented or turned on strategically. Um, if you put this on hours in advance, you're going to have a nice wet lawn, um, but if the fire doesn't actually get there, it can cause damage to the building or structure. Okay. All right. All right. One, one. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, what what is, are the latest sort of fire predictions? We've had some moisture lately uh, for Nordig and I guess the rest of the county. Sure. So uh, I actually just sat through a weather briefing for us this morning before coming in. Short term looks like there may be an opportunity to see a little bit more precipitation before we actually move into our drier season, which is normally the end of April into May for most of the province of Alberta. Um, right now we are in a moisture deficit. It's, it's known, it's across the media. There is drought conditions, especially to the south and southeast of us here. Ourselves, we've uh, fared fairly well. I believe the last numbers I saw, we were about 80% of what our normal precipitation was for the winter. So we, we still were in a deficit going in last fall and we are in a deficit starting this spring. So um, the biggest thing with wildfire season though is it depends on what the seasonal or spring rains do for us. So if it rains in uh, the middle of April or end of April, that really provides us uh, that reprieve that we need going from snow gone to, until we actually see that first rainfall. So um, we know the fuel conditions are dry. The grasses are always tinder dry this time of year until you see that green up and when the rain actually comes. So. But yeah, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Unfortunately, we do the best that we can with the information we gather, but um, it really depends what Mother Nature does for us going forward to what the hazard season might actually look like. But I can tell you what it looks like right now, at least, so. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. So I have a question in regards to you, and you kind of touched on it, that uh, you know recruitment is ongoing, so you're not necessarily filled on this, and you did speak a little bit about the spontaneous citizenry and, and possible training. Um, yes, we're getting into the busy season and stuff like that. Could this citizenry training happen off season? Is this something that we could be proactive about in the future? Or is this something that um, we, we only do this when there's a crisis, I guess? <laughs> I'd, I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, the Premier's call last year, I mean, caught us off guard when she went on the media and said, you know, if you have any experience, then volunteer. And of course, people want to go right out and get a shovel in their hands and fight fire. And we're not, we're not about that. Um, 
there's certainly support positions working in warehouses, key punching, data entry. Uh, doesn't you know? There's there's no safety problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, so some of that stuff could take fairly minimal training. Um, I don't think we've actually determined what a base level of training would be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for our own firefighters, I mean, you know, we even just to drive our trucks, they have to prove a certain amount of proficiency. Um, so we actually didn't do that. We were too busy to do that with our volunteers last year. So um, those are some of the things we probably should try and address. And I don't think we've determined what even what the training requirement would be for our, for our volunteers. So what would the proper channel be? Like, I'm just thinking, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we all see need, we all want to volunteer when there's a crisis. Uh, you know, rural people seem to be, you know, um, I want to help, how can I help? So what would you advise as far as help and where, and where is the proper channel to go look? So I, I believe there's going to be a, a, a group in Edmonton coordinating those those volunteers. So there would be, a, I don't know if there's a 1-800 number or what it is, but there's a way to get a hold of that okay. group, get on a list, see what your abilities are. And they would, they would they did that a little bit last year. What, what are your abilities? What can you do? Where mm -hmm. can we possibly use you? Mm -hmm. um, and then ship people out to the forest areas. Okay. You know, the only one I know that was real successful, there was a fellow from Medicine Hat who used to work for us years ago as a firefighter, ended up going high level as a, as a camp boss. So, and he was there until they shut the camp down in December. So wow. um, I'm not aware of too many others that actually spent significant time volunteering with us. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. And, and I do understand that uh, when, when the strike happens, you have to react quickly. And, and uh, like I say, in rural, we seem to be all hands on deck and we want to help where we can. And, and I agree with you, um, information needs to happen fast, current, and often. So with that, so. Yeah, Is it did work, sorry, it did work oh. really well last year when yep. uh, Evan came right into our office. And, um, uh, you know, fire, I lost track of the fire numbers, the fire near the reserve that was heading off to the west there. <laughs> um, Evan was parked right in our office. That was invaluable for us and I think probably for you guys as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. For and sure. probably Chris's card isn't even cancelled yet because I haven't done it. <laughs> so he'll just sneak in the back door I'm sure. There you go. Well if, if there's any other questions from council, please uh, go ahead Deputy Reeve. Uh, thank you, Reeve. No, again, thank you so much for coming in. And obviously you work directly with, with our team extremely well. So um, look forward to this community getting the benefit of, of that collaboration uh, again this season. Um, and I would make the motion that Council receives the Alberta Wildfire Rocky Mountain House Forest Area update for information. Thank you for that. Uh, Council Ratcliffe? No? Okay. Uh, 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 this good. The, what, what I heard as well out in uh, Nordegg was uh, how much um, better the communications is with the community and the other related fire groups. So uh, uh, that made a huge difference for the comfort of the community. So okay. thank you for that. We hope to, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> hope to improve that even further because uh, we haven't had an information officer since uh, Barry, was it three years ago that he was, that he left probably? Mm -hmm. So we hope to even improve that further. So. Great, thank you. All right, motion on the floor to accept for information. I'll call the question, all those in favor. And that's carried. Thank you again for coming in, gentlemen. Have a great day, and I hope it's not as busy as a year for you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so now we have a motion for that. Uh, we do have a 9.30 delegation coming in. Uh, we'll be a few minutes, um, what, five minutes? Do we wanna take a quick five minute break? Okay, we'll take a five minute break.
and welcome back from our break. Uh, we are in agenda item 4.2, and that is a presentation from the Rocky and District uh, Recreation Parks and Community Services Board. And before we begin, we're going to do some introductions. And I'll start with my right. Good morning. I'm Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division 2. Uh, good morning, Daryl Lockham, Councillor of Division 3. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, Division 1, and Deputy Reach. Good morning, Michelle Swanson, Division 7, and Reach. Good morning, Jordan Northcott, Division 4, Councillor. Welcome, gentlemen. Neil Ratcliffe, Councillor for Division 5. Good morning, Brian Cermak, Councillor for Division 6. Good morning, Murray Hagan, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Rick Emmons, CEO. Good morning, Clay Jostheim, I'm with the Rec Board. Good morning, Wendell Mason, also with the Rec Board. Thank you very much. So with that, um, I believe uh, you gentlemen have a presentation and I'll let you take it away. Uh, good morning, council members and staff. We're here on behalf of the Rec, Parks and Community Services Board to express our commitment and passion for the community and all the facilities and programs that it offers. We understand the recreation agreement and the terms of reference are under review by both town and county councils and we thought it'd be beneficial to share with you the value of our board. The board consists of community members that come from diverse backgrounds in recreation and parks and have a vested interest in seeing growth and the well-being of our programs and facilities throughout the community. We provide input from stakeholders and provide relevant insight from the community. This board believes it can further contribute by providing an increased insight into the rec master plan and planning for new capital projects, public consultations with user groups which would provide insights into funding allocation towards new capital projects. We kindly request Council's consideration in granting the Rec Board a more substantial role within the Rec Master Plan framework. By doing so, we can further strengthen the representation and accountability of decisions made for the betterment of our community, but also foster an environment of inclusivity and collaboration. We believe that the Rec Board is a key voice for the public, which can provide insight as the Recreation, Parks and Community Services Board looks forward to supporting the County's vision. Missions and value, mission and values in being proactive in developing efficient and effective relationships or partnerships that provide benefit for residents and businesses. All right. That's Thank open you. for questions. All right, open for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Reeve Meloff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, have you had an opportunity to review Clearwater County's um, recreation boards? Um, they have a terms of reference and are granted um, a budget uh, every every budget cycle and work at arm's length independent like they work with our administration and they have a separate board and budget um, is that the type of framework that you're that you're looking for if not I would encourage you to look at those terms of reference to see if it's something we'd be into yeah I, I'm not as familiar with that separate board or the terms of reference but I think as far as what we're trying to achieve in, in expanding our role would be to not only familiarize ourselves with that but that board but also work with that board as well and collaborate in terms of looking to grow our community from a parks recreation um, you know wanting to be that you know destination for people to come to people to you know want to move to this community to have you know the facilities the programs and things like that that can help our community grow and bring people and attract more people as well too right supplementary yep uh, thank you do you have suggestions for the terms of reference like or just you'd like us to take this and try to run with it or do you have actual like um, concrete suggestions thanks uh we don't have concrete suggestions obviously that's why we're um, coming to have this discussion However, we feel right now that as it sits, it's more of a sounding board. We listen to um, delegations, we listen to their business, but outside of that, it's um, when we do, I used this reference last week and another delegation is, you know, we had a delegation come to us and it was great. Um, they presented a plan, but ultimately at the end of the day, we don't make that decision. It was a waste of their time to be frank. Um, we feel that we see things, we just had a good, um, discussion a couple weeks ago reviewing the rec master the 10-year rec master plan within the town and there was things that identified need to be moved up on the priority list and there's stuff that's 
been already met that need to be removed. So um, with, the, with that being said, we just feel that we can help prioritize that and take the feedback from the user groups so you don't have 50 delegations coming, you know, reviewing what they want. Excellent, thank you. A uh, question for you guys. Uh, how long have you been serving on the board? I think I've been on there for five months now. Um, I, I grew up in this community. I grew up in the county, actually, as a county resident, and you know, went to school in Rocky. You know, played sports, went camping, like mm -hmm. did it all, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's the thing that I, I struggle with is, you know, I when I was eighteen, I wanted nothing to do but get out of this community, and then move back, obviously. And you see a lot of young families, especially looking elsewhere, right? You're looking to Sylvan Lake, you're looking to look home, Black Falls, seeing this fail. Why can't Rocky be that destination, right? And I think parks and recreation is a big factor in that, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been on it for probably about a year and a half now, I would say, um, through, you know, a couple different reps from the county and uh, the town. So um, I just, I see in my time, obviously a little bit longer than Clay's, I've seen a lot of good ideas presented and it fails to gain any traction. Um, there's a lot of things that we present and it's just, we get the, it's not a level of service that we're prepared to. Um, and, I, and I understand it's gotta be um, slow growth. We can't build the Taj Mahal overnight, but there is, I think, things that we need to focus on and prioritize and move towards. So like Clay said, that we can attract the mill workers, the doctors, the people that come to our community and want to stay as opposed to taking that, you know, 45 minutes away and just driving back and forth. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, I think both of you are recognized for your leadership in uh, community events and building uh, the, you know, the sports teams and recreation you're involved in. And uh, I, I guess your intent as community builders, uh, I think we need to let people like that, um, I, I guess, turn them loose to achieve in the community. A big question though that I guess has kind of already been raised is how. If you have a vision to uh, to how that might be done, um, I, th I think you know with ourselves, um, we have vested interest in seeing this community grow with young families, um, and not only you know obviously I represent a couple more um, associations directly, but I think it's for overall growth of everything. I think you got to sit back no different than you guys do. Um, and represent our people. There, there's other programs that want to grow or get off the ground and we limit them. We don't allow them to take off or we don't have the facilities to support that growth. Um, I'm, I'm a prime example at the ice. Prime ice is hard to come by. Um, we all know we can get ice in the middle of the day, but with our demographic that we deal with, it's hard to get those kids here um, to utilize that time with people at work and school. Um, coming in so um, I just think there's programs out there uh, the ringette program they want to get going which is fantastic but it, it you know it's we have to accommodate that and how do you squeeze that in um, and, and there's other things that people have tried to start and I just I think with guys with vested interest and young families we we want our town and our county to grow yeah and we we want to increase the level of community engagement too right like that's you know, being here for so long, that's something that hasn't always been that great, right? Like we, the town sends surveys out. I don't know, not, not as familiar with what the county um, does for community engagement, but. We feel your pain. Yeah, way, like so. it's, <laughs> like so we feel that again, we can be that sounding board for, you know, these smaller groups, like not just the minor hockeys, the baseballs, the soccers, but the smaller groups, like, you know, if there's kids with disabilities that need programming or funding and things like that, like any, like Ringette is a good example. Like they, they came to us, um, I believe last year and it's, it's starting to grow, right? So 
just being that sounding board, but being able to actually do something about it, right? Not just being that sounding board and then nothing happens, right? So. Thank you. Um, subsequent or you? Um, another light so. I'll come back to me, please. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Grant. Thank you. I don't have any questions, but I think this is really important. I, I got to work with Wendell last year on the board and he brought forward many great ideas and to see that life in the board is so great to see the passion. Um, and people, parents in particular, are out there and they're able to see things that council doesn't see, that staff and administration don't see that are problems. I remember the painting the bleachers at the, the, ball, the ball diamonds was a big problem and I think that a, a community member ended up doing it from my understanding because it wasn't happening and things like that. And I don't see why the board couldn't have that kind of power to kind of prioritize those, those things that they see and just having a small budget, then it would be very possible, I think. It's, I don't know that it's represented in our council, but often councils tend to be primarily older individuals who aren't involved in recreation. And so, you know, we're fortunate to have younger individuals and people who are involved in recreation on this, on this council who maybe see things more, but we don't know who's gonna be on the next council. It could be people who don't care about recreation at all. So to have community members who are able to continue and to build on the recreation that, that doesn't die, die with this council on, for the town and the, and the, the county. Um, topics also become very political for us. We, you guys know, I don't need to tell you. <laughs> I don't need to go any deeper on that one. But for community members, it's not so political. It's, you know, this is what we see, this is what we hear, it's easy. We're not being attacked so much for, for our choices. Um, and, you know, we had our waste survey, which was the most successful survey, I think, in history of the county, possibly. And the reason it was so successful was because we went to where people were using we're using the waste where they were affected. And I think that doing, I hate surveys personally, but I think that if we're gonna do surveys to bring them to the people that are using the recreational facilities and what better to have people doing that than parents who are already there and running it. So I think there are a lot of positives. I'm glad you guys came here and, and took your time to come and present to us because I, I agree 100%. It would be more valuable to have, have this board have a little more power. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Rockliffe. Thank you, Reeve. Yes, Councillor Graham put it, it very well of uh, how much we need community volunteers working to bring these amenities and, and have these amenities used. And certainly Council recognizes the need to have younger families uh, get them to stay here or even to attract them. So, um, Councillor Graham is, is quite right that we need a board uh, actively out there uh, doing that community building. So see, oh, Councillor Lahey, please. Maybe too, I would yeah. just, just share that um, Clearwater County has had a history of success with its, um, some of the initial groups within, uh, um, within the county managing recreation, leveraging not only the, the funds that Clearwater County can support, but the energies of the community and those individuals. We saw the success in that and we tried to extend that out to more, more of the county as well. And I think those programs are showing good signs of success and hopefully this is an opportunity we can demonstrate to our other partners in recreation that there is a benefit to leverage the good intentions, the, the energies of the community, along with, along with the uh, commitment to create those recreational opportunities through, through the public purse um, as well. So I, I wish you uh, continued success as you move forward. And uh, perhaps this is a good, uh, good agenda topic to come up to uh, one of our ICC meetings in the near future. So. Yeah, thank you. I will give you guys the any concluding thoughts or statements that you'd like to um, say before we. No, I just uh, thanks for your time. Um, yes. I got it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for everything. Um, yeah, just I guess a couple things just to close up. We, uh, you know, there's things that we bring. Um, we feel to the rec board, and like I said, we just feel it doesn't get any traction or get the ball rolling. Whether it's outside sponsorship opportunities. Um, like I, I touched on a little bit about slow growth. I mean, you gotta, you can't run out there and build everything overnight, but 
you know, I'll use a prime example was, you know, uh, they applied for the Alberta 2026 Summer Games, which, you know, the whole framework was set up for a city to take it, but um, it was a complete waste of time and effort and dollars, ultimately, at the end of the day, to put that proposal together. When we don't meet the minimum guidelines for swimming at the, uh, seating at the swimming pool, um, ball diamond dimensions, like, it was a five minute overview um, that I took and I knew that we couldn't, you know, if there's no capital set aside to expand those projects, it's why do we spin our wheels or why do we go through the time and effort when we don't meet all the criteria. So those are things that I think in the future as we, you know, if we can grow facilities, we need to look at those things and say, hey, does this set, up, set us up for future success that we can apply for those things down the road? Um, because I know they had the games here, Masters games, and it was a success, but how do we grow those down the road? We gotta have the facilities to be able to host that, so. Yeah, and, and building those those inputs from the recreation master plan, or those recommendations, I should say, into the 10-year capital plans, right? And not just talking about them, but actually planning and looking for funding and things like that, right? Um, having a 10-year plan, right? Uh, Recommendations from a from a ten year rec master plan are great. They don't achieve anything if they're not acted upon, right? And I think that's where we can help. So. Absolutely. Well, and we all know too, right? There, like, with populations, um, you know, um, who who knew that video gaming was going to be a, an Olympic sport? Uh, you know, things like that. Um, where we live in a very uh, pristine area of, of the province of where outdoor sport could really be capitalized in our region and we you know the, the smaller groups like you've mentioned uh, are out there and uh, it's how do you support them and how do you grow them and make them known to the, the greater because uh, we all can see an arena and we all see the curling and things like that and, and I'm not they are great, but there's only a certain amount of, of options uh, out, out there so I, I admire your enthusiasm, I admire your passion in this, and uh, with that, let's hope that there's more discussion uh, at an ICC level where we, we are redoing our terms of reference and our rec agreement, and we, we will take that into consideration. Perfect. So, Appreciate it. You yep. bet. Thank, Thank you very Thanks. much for coming. And with that, um, go ahead, Deputy Reeve. Uh, thank you, uh, Reeve. Um, I echo everything that uh, she had she has said, um, and I will just make the motion that Council receives the presentation from the Rocky and District Recreation, Parks, and Community Services Service Board members for information. Thank you. Uh, motion on the floor. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Now moving on in our agenda, we are at 5.1. And it is the first reading of bylaw 1187-24. And the, uh, to amend the land use bylaw. And I will look at uh, planning and cross away. And I'll pass it over to planner, Mr. Clark. Morning, Council. Thank you, Reeve. Uh, application before you is to amend uh, is to amend uh, land use bylaw. Uh, William Nelson currently holds title to Southeast 15, Ward 41, 6 west of the 5th, which contains 154.96 acres. The subject land is in the agricultural district and is located approximately 26 kilometers northeast of the town of Rocky Mountain House. Sheldon Van Der Veen, on behalf of William Nelson, has made an application to redesignate 21 acres located in the northeast portion of the quarter section from agricultural district to the intensive agriculture district. The remaining 133.96 acres of the quarter section would remain under the agriculture district. Pending the outcome of the land use amendment, the applicant will then proceed with the subdivision application process to create a separate 21 acre intensive agriculture parcel. The proposed 21 acre parcel is undeveloped 
access to the proposed intensive ag parcel will be obtained from a new access off of Range Road 6 2 and access to remainder and access to remainder of the quarter section can be obtained from the existing access off of Range Road 6 2 adjacent to the east property boundary. The applicant is proposing to amend the land use bylaw to allow the creation of VB AV boarding, a small horse horse boarding facility providing adequate safe space for six to eight horses. This facility will provide corrals to contain the borders. Feeding will be monitored and additional su supplements and um, medication will be administered as needed. The, f the facility will also provide additional amenities as clients will have access to the outdoor riding, to an outdoor riding arena during business hours. The applicant has indicated future expansion into possibly small cat cattle operation and beekeeping. The proposed land use amendment will allow for the applicant to live on site while providing a manageable parcel for of agricultural land suitable to start the proposed business. This will allow for a manageable parcel point to operate the business while allowing someone to purchase the traditional farming on the remainder of the quarter section. The surrounding land use in the area is mainly agriculture with a few residential parcels um, attached is the package uh, provides more details on the proposed development and the applicant is here to present um, at the meeting to speak to the proposal. Uh, has council had a chance to go through um, the sections from the land use bylaw and MDP? Policy considerations. The redesignation of the land to create intensive agricultural parcel to operate horse boarding operation. Uh, the access to the, prop to the property will be obtained from Rain Road 6 2, which is a county maintained road. The proposed 21 acre parcel fits within the intensive ag district as a smaller as the smaller property can sufficiently maintain the business desired by the applicant without having the large scale, having the scale and responsibility of uh, maintaining the entire quarter. The parcel will allow for, the parcel will allow for a different approach to using farmland and the size of the farm. The proposed business operations on the parcel are better utilized if separated from the quarter section. Based on the proposed business, the district will be, the district will be able to support the support on um, the proposed operation while allowing for a more diverse agriculture opportunity and allowing the applicant to make agriculture their livelihood. After reviewing and considering the impacts on the adjacent farming activity, staff feels that the proposal would not neg negatively impact the farming operations in the area as the proposal is similar in nature to operations found in the agricultural district. Uh, Public Works, Regional Fire, along with other agencies will receive an opportunity to comment on the, propose, uh, on the proposal during the referral stage process. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Does uh, council have any questions for planning? Uh, go ahead, Deputy Reef Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. How many residents are on this parcel? Uh, currently, there is two residents on the parcel. Okay. There's four of the little hexagons um, on page 39. One of them is already a parcel off, the first subdivision off. And then yeah. there's three other little hexagons. Are those not residents? Uh, there's a resident uh, in that southwest, southeast cor corner. Um, there is also a resident in that north, sorry, southwest portion. And there is a residence that is there. So yes, there's three residents, sorry. No, there's two. three. Yeah. Um, and just confirming the land use bylaw allows for a primary and a secondary residence on an agricultural parcel. Yes, there are allowed up to two um, residents on the... Okay. On the quarter, yeah. Uh, yep, supplementary. Go supplementary, yeah. yep. 
What is NRCB's it? definition um, of uh, confined or intense equine operations? Um, I do not have the definition on me at this moment, okay. but uh, I could look into that and get back. That would be too. great. I just want to make sure that we're in, in alignment with but, there is an intensive livestock operation as the definition of this is. I want to make sure that we're in alignment with the provincial regulations of intensive agriculture. Yes, um, but for it to for it to meet a uh, confined feeding <gasps> operation, that would that would fall to the province, Absolutely. and that would uh, we would not have much say in regards to it if it meets the requirements of confined feeding. And based on the application, it would not meet the requirements of confined a confined feeding operation. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Lahi. Perhaps maybe I've, I've missed something here, and I, I know um, <coughs> Deputy Reed Milhoff asked the question already, but I see four dots or hexagons there. Is that one on the very corner? Is that something different? I just just trying to understand the, the number of actual. Uh, the one on the south southeast southwest corner. Are you yes, speaking to? Yes, I believe that would be the southwest. Yes. Um, that is a residence based off of the information seen, yes. So each of those dots would be a residence? Yes. Okay. And one is our first parcel, yeah. Okay. okay. Any supplement? No supplementary. Any more questions from Council? Council Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. Um, our requirements for an area structure plan are based on um, the number of parcels rather than the number of residences? Yes, the number of, uh, you'd have to, when you're, when you're doing the third parcel load, then you'd require uh, uh, your structure plan. So currently, based on the application, it would not meet the requirements to, to meet, to have an area structure plan at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, Councillor Graham. I know Deputy Reeve Melhoff asked this, but I just want to confirm because if it's over 80 acres, it's two residences that's yes. allowed, right? It's not three? Yes, over 80 acres are two. It's supposed to require two residents. I um, I would have to look into, into more detail why there is another, but at, the point, at this point in time, it's supposed to be minimum of two, so maximum of two residents. Okay, so there's one too many residents on this property yes. already. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Deputy Reed Mello? Oh, I didn't, oh, I actually sorry. didn't even press it this there time. There you go, oh, okay, I just seen the light. Okay, there you go. Yes, uh, seeing as how uh, there's already four residents, yes, um, um, and this is for, is this a, a wet area? Because I'm looking at the, the photo and it looks a little on the wet side, uh, so, no? No, it's not, it's outside of the wet area, okay. based off of... Um, of the area. In, based off of the area and information from the province wetland inventory, there is no, it's just outside of the wet area. Okay, thank you. All right, so staff recommendation is to uh, grant first reading and proceed to a public hearing. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Graham. Sorry, I guess I should ask them when there's too many residences. Is the person who wants this industrial ag parcel one of those residents, and they will be moving there, or I assume you're that gentleman? Yeah, uh, I don't live there. So okay, no, but okay, I see what you're saying. It's, okay, but I will be moving there if it is granted. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, Councillor uh, Sermak. Uh, the yellow line on here that goes through this subdivision or the proposed subdivision, is that a waterway that goes through there? No, there is no waterway passing through the parcel at this moment. So, so what is the yellow line about? Um, the yellow line would be the line from the uh, farm assessment rating. Farm, yeah, farm assessment, soil type, soil type. Oh, that's a soil type. Yes. So that's indicating where the um, rating changes, that yellow line that you see there. Okay. okay. Any further questions? If not, looking for a motion. Uh, 
Go ahead, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. I will uh, make the motion that Council grant first reading. Oops, sorry. Okay. To uh, bylaw 1187-24. And uh, we can proceed to a public hearing. Okay. Motion on the floor. Any discussion on the motion? I know for myself, um, I won't be supporting this. Um, I've, I feel if there's already four residents, I think that we should be, um, I understand the, the, the intensive ag. I, I, I would maybe entertain um, a smaller subdivision and not, not under the intensive, intensive ag um, land use, uh, maybe as a, as a residential uh, parcel itself, CRA. So um, I won't be supporting uh, first reading. Any uh, Councillor Graham? I was going to ask because the three residents, like four total, concern me as well. Is there any way that we can get clarification that there's actually people living there, or are is there potential that they're old houses that no one's living in? Or yeah, yes, I can look into that matter. Okay, Councillor Northcott. Um, yeah, I, I won't be supporting it. I don't believe, in my opinion, that this meets the definition of intensive ag. Councillor, or sorry, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, while I absolutely um, love to see, um, especially agricultural pursuits, um, I think it's important that we legalize properties prior to granting more um, more subdivision opportunities. Um, so, unfortunately, I will not be supporting this today either. Um, but I would love you to work with uh, the planning department on legalizing the rest of the property um, and potentially uh, come back and chat with us again. Councillor Ratcliffe? Um, I will support the motion for first reading. Um, I have reservations um, about the number of residences already on this property. Uh, I feel the applicant should have uh, the right to that much process. And I'm undecided whether I would su support second or third reading. This okay. time I will support the motion. Okay. Uh, Councillor Lawhey? This time I'll be supporting the motion before us just because I feel it's important to have the community feedback on this kind of application. And I look forward to the clarification on the residences as well. So I look forward to that uh, time to be able to clarify much of the um, data around this okay. application. Uh, Councillor Graham? I have a question pertaining to process. If this were to be voted down, it's six months until it can be reapplied for. Should, right? Should it be maybe postponed and then we can get some clarification on the intensive ag and the residents and then if it is, if it is legal and everything, we can move forward instead of having to put it off six months? Just a suggestion. Go ahead, Mr. Clark. Um, I could be able to provide that clarification upon second reading or right before second reading. I will be able to provide that information. Councilor Cermak? I'd like a recorded one, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, question two also on process. If this motion is voted down, it doesn't mean that the applicant can come back with a different application in regards to a smaller subdivision if he decides to, or, or smaller, uh, it doesn't, but under this process, if it's voted down as an intensive egg, um, he would have to wait six months, correct? Go ahead, Mr. Clark. Based on based on the business based on the type of application it is, uh, this the proposed business would best fit under, or this is the only district the proposed business would fit under. Um, so, at a minimum requirement for an intensive ag parcel is twenty acres. Mm -hmm. So, uh, getting a smaller parcel or going to uh, a CRA parcel wouldn't would not meet the requirements for the type of business. Uh, applicants is proposing. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Go ahead, Councillor Graham. Sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot. No. I, I just don't think I can support first reading as it is, because um, I don't agree with all the extra residences. So, I, I would personally like to postpone it. I don't know if if there's any thoughts on anyone else wanting to do that, because if it is, if it is the fact that they are in following the rules and it's just not 
you know, houses aren't being lived in or whatever the case may be. Um, I don't want this, this individual to lose out on his opportunities, but we also need to be following the bylaws. So as it sits, I can't support first reading, but if we postpone it, maybe things could be clarified. Um, uh, thank you for that. And go ahead, uh, CO Ammons. Thank you, Reeve Swanson. And maybe if it helps, um, staff can definitely research this file out further. Um, as mentioned by council earlier, two residences are permitted, but a third could have been applied for under discretionary use. Um, so it might be worth digging into file and finding out whether or not this was appropriate or not, um, and bring that back for a second reading. Go ahead, Councillor Grant. My concern is just then people in the future are going to come forward and say, "Well, you approved this one with three, and because it'll be used, it'll be used in people's favor for what they want." And I just don't want to cause that, and that's my concern about voting in favor of first reading because it won't matter if we vote it down in second reading then because it'll be well you supported first reading. So that's. Yep. where my head is at and I, I agree with you and I also agree with um, there's administration's time and there's the applicants time and I don't want to waste the applicants time if this council isn't going to support second and third reading why are we going through waiting another month to go through this process I understand that we need to do our due diligence and and get all the information so uh, you know the postponement um, again could I, I, I would probably entertain a postponement just for more information but at the end of the day I'm kind of like as as indicated we we don't want to waste and wasting time isn't uh, a proper terminology but I think time's of essence for all of us and and uh, and where, where everything's going Councillor Lockheed maybe perhaps a bit of a devil's advocate here but I, I would support a postponement in this case because I think one of the challenges we we, we have with going through land land use uh, redesignations or rezonings is being consistent in our application of the process. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to, um, if we want to actually hear the feedback of the community on these proposals, which I think is important in the process we've chosen to go forward, I think we need to be consistent in that approach. And I, what I'm hearing around the table is that some people are uncomfortable with the concept that there are already three residences on this property and that's why they're not supporting going to the public for feedback on they want to know more information so I tend to agree with um, Councillor Graham that at this moment it might be better to postpone until we have that additional data that many people around this table have actually asked for and it's just not available at the moment maybe a postponement would be the best approach to this and remain consistent in our approach to these applications. That's just my two cents at the moment. There you go. So with that information, and uh, as suggested, uh, Councillor Graham is, would, is suggesting a postponement, uh, should we decide to, uh, or should we <laughs> uh, entertain that idea or want to consider that idea? Is there any other information that, administration or uh, planning can bring forward in that postponement and maybe we'll go to the question maybe the motion first and then have that discussion and uh, on that vote if that works with uh, <laughs> Councillor Graham I'll make a motion that we postpone this until we have further information okay so with due process uh, I know there's a motion on the floor for this but um, I understand that, but but you can you can if you're postponing, is my understanding, and I look across the room to <laughs> Robert's rules. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, okay, go ahead, Councillor Ratcliffe. Then. Thank you. Um, I, I will withdraw the motion. Um, in order to entertain the uh, motion to this postpone. Okay, motion is withdrawn. So with process, <laughs> there is another motion or 
I'll go, let's do this in, in the right order. Go ahead, Councillor Graham again. I apologize. I thought that you could postpone on top of another mo motion as well. I, that was but my motion. I, I would like to make a motion that we postpone this until we have further information. Okay. So this is now discussion on the postponement motion. So, Go ahead, postponing Councilor. this agenda, agenda item, item item to a later date, date for more information based on information yes. being available. Yes. Okay, I understand then. Yeah, and I I have a motion with this motion of postponement. I would like Council if there's more information that they require that this is at this time given. This is what we would like because why for for information that we would require for that postponement next at the next meeting or when this agenda item comes back. Correct. Claire's mind. Go ahead, Councillor Cermak. <laughs> um, I know that there's a motion we need a date. Robert Trudeau says you need a date for when it's gonna come back. So what does administration say that they can do this, come back our next meeting or the meeting after or, or what? Uh, Mr. Clark, do you have a, an opportunity to? Um, uh, I could, I will research all the matter, but uh, in regards to dates, uh, it doesn't have to be a date. I could just put the item back on the agenda for the whenever I have all the information available for council. So if there are any additional information, um, I'll also research that matter and then bring it back to um, council, whether it be the next meeting or the meeting after that. Okay. So uh, you're offering uh, April, or sorry, April, um, either to tw April 23rd or on May 14th is what, what you're offering for possible dates to have this information added to the agenda item. Uh, poss possible date. It also depends on what's already on the agenda item and mm -hmm. um, what other scheduling okay, matters need to be met, but okay. um, that's possible dates. Uh, I could present this item. Okay. So also pending info extra information. Uh, go ahead, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, and then I'll go to Councillor Norscott. Um, thank you, Reeve. Um, does that meet your legislative requirements? Um, as I know, there's many legislative requirements for the planning department. Um, does that still meet those legislated needs? There is a 30-day referral process, and after that 30-day referral process, I could bring the item back, or I could just bring the item to give, being that we haven't um, done first reading, you uh, wouldn't, wouldn't start the 30-day referral process. You wouldn't being that we do haven't, the 30-day referral process if you haven't done being that first we haven't, reading, correct? Yeah, being that we haven't approved first reading, I don't believe we'll have to do the 30-day referral process. Um, hello, Ms. Gillum. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm just going to jump in here. There is no legislative requirement for land use amendment, so we can bring it back essentially whenever we have the information available. It's not like a subdivision or development, so there is no Perfect. specific timeline required. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Northcott. All right. Um, I won't be supporting postponing this. Uh, really, we're looking for the status of these four houses or four planning is here, the applicant is here, we're looking for information regarding these four houses and if it's simple as it should be, this should be able to be, this information is available right now in the room so I, for something so simple with this application to come to council, um, if we're going to have to postpone this to look for additional information when really, I think it's a sign for just a, it's, it's unpreparedness for this meeting, um, like there's, there's the information should be right here in this room right now, but I won't be supporting postponing this. I, I believe there's also extra, extra information, Councillor Northcott, in regards to uh, as Deputy Reed Melhoff has requested that the NRC, NR, NRCB definition for equine intensive ag, uh, we'd like that to be consistent. And I believe there was one other, I think there was three items that we were bringing back for that. And I'm, thank you for um, bringing that up though, uh, yes, I think we all visually could see that there was four, but we just want to confirm with everything. Um, so there is a motion on the floor to postpone. 
Is there any other information that we could offer Mr. Clark for information that we'd like him to bring back other than those, those uh, information items? I see no more lights. Okay, this is a vote for postponement. I will, uh, Councillor uh, Northcott. Sorry, um, Councillor Cermak had made a, requested a recorded vote. Does that yes. still stand for this uh, postponement vote? It was for the recorded vote was for the, the motion that was withdrawn. Okay, then I request a recorded vote for the postponement. Okay. All right. Uh, motion is on the floor to postpone. I'll call the question. All those in favor of postponement? Those opposed? And that motion is carried. Thank you for very much. Uh, I will look forward to that information as it comes forth at the, the next agenda meeting. Our next meeting, sorry, or when it comes forward. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Moving on in our agenda, we are at new business 6.1, and 6.1A is road closure application. And looking across the room, I believe that goes to um, Mr. Do Mr. Conley. I'll pass it on to you, please. Thank you, Reeve. We have received an application to close a portion of road plan 5510PX, an unmaintained road running through northwest 2935 of 8, adjacent to plan 102 5627 block 1 lot 4. The applicant, Gail Williamson, is in the process of bringing her property into compliance, and this is the last step to do so. Plan 102527 Block 1 Lot 4 surrounds the unmaintained road on all sides. Currently, the septic system on the property is non compliant because it crosses the property boundary and goes under the road. Should this road closure application be approved, approximately 1.66 acres of road would be consolidated with the remainder of Plan 102527 Block 1 Lot 4. In addition to the applicant's request, Clearwater County Public Works Department has no objection in the consideration of closing a portion of road plan 5510PX. In order to close this portion of the road, a resolution process is followed. The application is referred to applicable government agencies, utility companies, and to the adjacent landowners. The application is then presented to council for a decision. There is no requirement for a public hearing or consent from adjacent landowners due to the location of the adjacent road allowances. If the resolution is passed, the application is then sent to Alberta Transportation for ministerial approval. Alberta Transportation will prepare the documentation necessary to transfer the road to the appropriate owner. Staff is recommending that Council approve the closure of a portion of road plan 5510PX running through Northwest 2935 of 8. Uh, in accordance with Section 22 of the MGA, Chapter M26 as amended. Whereas the land hereafter are no longer required for public travel, now therefore be it resolved that the Clearwater County Council does hereby close the following described road subject to the rights of the access granted by other legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council? I have one. So when this comes off or when it's passed through ministry, will there be a sign that says this is, because I mean, on a, on a map, it'll still indicate an undeveloped road. So will there be a sign indicating that this is no longer there? Like, I know it's with the past, so I'll, I guess I looked, uh, Ms. Gillum, maybe you can answer that for me. Um, <clears throat> once the road is closed, um, it will be consolidated with the adjacent property and it'll be become part of that titled land. So, um, the road won't, will no longer show on maps, um, after that's completed. Um, it would be up to the landowner to put, um, like a, um, road closer, like dead end road or, um, private property type sign to indicate that. Um, I think the majority of the people that use this road are for that business anyways, so it shouldn't be an issue, but. Okay, thank you. Deputy Reeve Melville. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, in your background, it says it is non-compliant because it crossed the property boundary. 
um, isn't this the same title that just happens to have a road go through it? So it doesn't cross the property boundary, does it? It just goes underneath a registered road plan. That's correct. Okay, that's why I'm looking for some clarification. So this technically counts as a boundary, just as a strip boundary. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lahey. Thank you, Reeve Swanson. Just, just for my clarification, this is a, a road defined by a road plan, but it has not been maintained by Clearwater County, or it has. It has I guess what I'm trying to get at, has the public purse invested in this road over the last number of years? Do we have an investment that we want to tell our citizens that they've got their full value out of this, or is this something that is just existed as a road plan and has never been maintained by Clearwater County. Ms. Gill? Um, I'm not sure about when it was initially created, um, but in recent years it has not been maintained. Like Public Works does not maintain that road from my understanding of speaking with them. And typically the public doesn't use this road other than... To access the property directly adjacent. To it, I'm not. To be honest, I'm not sure why it was created in the first place, okay. um, the way it was. But. Okay. Any further questions? No, you're good. Yep. Okay. All right. So the motion uh, uh, staff recommendation has been put before us. Is looking for a motion from council. Go ahead, Councillor Cermak. Uh, on this property, according to this map I look at. They're going to keep the approach coming up to where the yellow line starts, and that's the approach into this piece of property. And so it, it did end there. How does it get to give to those little runoffs? Because there's a yellow space there that's got no road. Go ahead, Mr. Conlon. The runoff in the northern portion of the property is within the plan. Northern part? Yeah. But this is the only access into this property, right? That's correct. Pardon? Off of this non-maintained road. But only the road plan is the section. The rest is private already. Yep, that's all private. So, so then they're going to, this road will just turn become into their... Become, become a private road. That'll be their own private road. Yep. Okay. We're just taking it out off of, the request is off the proper public designation into a private, and she is bringing it into compliance. As Ms. Gillum says, she doesn't know, understand why it was there in the first place. So, anyways, totally understand. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, anyway, staff recommendation, I'm looking for a motion. Councillor Lougheed. Very much, although I don't understand why this road exists to start with in, in that thing, I would uh, um, motion... Uh, according to the staff recommendation. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Moving on to 6.1B is a development permit application for the Rocky, Born, Rocky Barnstormers. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll take a quick five minute break if we could, please. Okay. Five.
And welcome back. We're back from a quick break. We are at item 6.1B in new business in regards to the development permit application for the Rocky Barns, uh, Barnstormers. I'll turn the floor over to Miss Billy. Oh, can we just do introductions first and then we'll get started if that works? Okay, I'll start with um, Division 2. Good morning, I'm Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division 2. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, Daryl Lougheed, Councillor for Division 3, and that's on the east east side of the county in the central region. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, uh, Division 1 Councillor and Deputy Reeve. Good morning, Michelle Swanson, Reeve and Division 7. Good morning, uh, Jordan Northcott, Division 4 Councillor. Good morning, Neil Ratcliffe, Councillor in Division 5. I'm, I'm still admiring your uh, visual aids here. <laughs> Greetings, uh, Ryan Cermak. Uh, Councillor for Division 6. Good morning, Murray Hagan, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Kim Gillum, Manager of Planning. Good morning, Rick Emmons, CEO. Good morning, Holly Beely, Senior Development Officer. Uh, Ray Bersinski, I'm uh, Secretary currently of the uh, Rocky Barnstormers. I've been uh, every position in the Barnstormers. Um, okay. Okay. Good. Well, I'm Voss. We farm in the Raven area, and I'm currently Vice President of the Rocky Barnstormers. Thank you. So with that, we will start the agenda, and I'll turn over to Ms. Bailey. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So Rocky Barnstormers RC Club has made application for development permit 2324 to utilize the southern portion of the Southwest 14, 39 of 8 to fly model airplanes as well as host two waterfly fun events a year. The subject land is located in the Farrier area, approximately five miles west of the town of Rocky Mountain House. This land is also known as the Stewart Pit, which has more recently been redesignated to a direct control district in Clearwater County's land use bylaw. On March 26, 2024, Padernes, who owns and operates the pit, received development approval to expand their gravel operations northward. In the DC district, council is the sole development authority wherein there is no provision to appeal a decision. Rocky Barnstormers RC Club is associated with Model Aeronautics um, Association of Canada, or MAAC. It is a nonprofit organization that brings together model airplane enthusiasts. The club was founded in 1982 and currently has 20 active members. They teach members to fly remote control airplanes and the skills to build and operate model planes. The club provides learning opportunities for all ages, teaching theory of flight and aircraft safety at various schools in the town of Rocky Mountain House. The proposed, proposed staging area for the club is located in the southeast portion of the Stewart Pit utilizing a partially reclaimed water body for takeoff and landing of their airplanes. Activities to occur on site include a pilot station, flight areas, and parking along the south property boundary. This site would be utilized on weekends beginning in May until the end of September. Flying of the RC airplanes is permitted a half hour after sunrise and ends a half hour or half, ends a half an hour prior to sunset as per the MACC guidelines. Pilots um, have a flight area of 1,000 feet by 1,000 feet that they must remain in for the duration of their flight. Every pilot must carry their MAAC card, transportation license, and liability insurance. The model airplane wingspans are generally seven to nine feet wide. Barnstormers um, have some planes that are slightly larger, approximately 15 feet. All airplane engines are shot off at designated areas prior to landing. The maximum sound level associated with the airplanes cannot exceed 96 decibels. This would be comparable to a muffled motorcycle, a small wood shop, or a 20 ton truck passing by. Spectators are not allowed in the pit or fly area unless they are accompanied by a pilot or instructor. Safety is a per, per Safety is a priority for the club. MACC has standardized rules that must be followed, and they had recently established a safety advisory board. 
In the 41 years Barnstormers has been operating, there has been no incidents or safety issues raised. Previous locations for the club have utilized Twin Lakes and then they utilized the Perry Pit in the northeast of 3240 of 7 for their water activities prior to approaching council for this request. The Perry Pit is in close proximity to Echo Canyon Multilot sub Subdivision and operated out of there for 38 years. Barnstormers also has a dry land flying location south of the town of Rocky Mountain House. Clearwater County has never received a complaint in regards to any of their activities. Rocky Barnstormers also would like to host two Waterfly Fun events out of this location yearly. These events are two days events associated with camping. All activities within, all activities will occur within the southeast portion of the pit, same as outlined above. Parking areas will not change, nor will the um, hours of possible flight times. At past events, there have been approximately nine to 15 campers brought out on the weekend. And on average at these events, there are approximately 20 people on the site at one time. There's also a designated spectator area and a rescue boat that's placed on the water, as well as a fire pit and an outhouse that is brought out. This is a smaller scale event and one of three that is held in the province of Alberta. So for planning direction, I've included various provisions from the Municipal Development Plan. So section seven, economic development, um, recognizes existing economic activities throughout the county, such as tourism-based industries. Section eight, um, recreation and special places, recognizes the potential and contributing um, factors of residential uses for economic development and social interaction opportunities. Putting the MDP into effect, the county shall implement the policies of the MDP and may require the applicant to prepare and submit various studies, as well as um, shall consider section 426, which outlines impacts on adjacent and nearby land uses, agricultural land, um, the environment, scale and density, site suitability, et cetera. From Clearwater County's land use bylaw, I've included the direct control district, wherein the purpose is to is to authorize and allow council to exercise particular and specific direction and control over the use of development um, for land and buildings. So referral letters were circulated. Um, comments were received from Alberta Health Services. They indicated they have no objection but offer the following for council's consideration. The nuisance and general sanitation regulations requires water be provided at public places to be potable. Um, when the water is intended to be used for public use or human consumption. Two, um, public events must meet the requirements of the nuisance and general sanitation regulations, specifically uh, the requirement of toilets and hand washing stations and during events to provide garbage bins which are removed in a timely manner. Three personnel on site during the events and they may require um, to complete an Alberta Health Services Environmental Public Health Special Events approval process. Blue Mountain Power Co-op had no concerns. Clearwater County's assessment department indicated that there is a community organization property tax exemption regulations and this may influence the assessment process and they encourage the applicants to contact them. Regional Fire had no concerns and indicated that once complete, if fire safety codes um, is requested, that they can now offer those services. And TELUS had no um, concerns. Five letters were received from adjacent landowners and copies of these letters were emailed to council along with a map outlining their location in proximity to the proposal. The summary of their concerns are as follows. Noise, noise was a number one concern and the additional disturbance that the proposal will cause outside of what adjacent landowners already have to listen to during the week. Their quality of life, if approved, there will no longer be peace and quiet out in this area. Decreased property value, the negative effects on the remaining 
wildlife and um, protected birds and their habitat. Negative effects on existing agricultural operations. There's a cow-calf operation that borders the property. Increased traffic. Um, limits that further develop limits further development opportunities on adjacent properties and the visual impact as many of these homes look down onto the proposal. So for planning considerations, um, Rocky Barnstormers RC Club is a rare and unique club proposed to utilize a portion of the Stewart Pit and host two events a year, spring and late summer, with approximately 15 RVs. The applicants have indicated that generally it's one person per RV. The club has been in operations for 41 years with no complaints noted on their file. The proposal provides for more tourist-based industry within Clearwater County, which complies with the MDP 711. That being said, the proposal will have impacts on surrounding lands and nuisance factors associated with it, such as noise, which shall be considered by council as per MDP 1426. This area is heavily populated with existing industry and there are numerous active gravel pits operating daily throughout the week, um, producing noise pollution. The subject land also borders a multi-lot residential subdivision to the north with other residential clusters in the area. Administration did include a fly area map outlining the 1,000 feet flight area, which is outside the residential area. Administration also reached out to our Public Works Department to see if there was possibly another alternative location to utilize a wet pit. Um, and generally, the county does not lease or rent these gravel pits for recreational use, only industry, such as water sales. As this land has been previously redesignated to the Direct Control District, Council is the sole decision maker, so there is no option to appeal this decision once it is made. So with that, um, administration's recommendations is that council review and consider development permit 2324 and A, approve the application with the following conditions I have listed or B, refuse the application. So should council wish to approve the application, um, condition one is the scope of the operation. So Rocky Barnstormers is a nonprofit organization that brings together model airplane enthusiasts any activities associated with the club shall be restricted to the southeast portion of the Southwest 14398, utilizing the designated water body and the land between the water body and the south property boundary in the southeast corner only. As outlined in the supplementary information, the use of model airplanes is not permitted when industry is present or operational on site. Condition two would be the operating area. The operating area shall be restricted to the most southeast portion of the Southwest 14, utilizing the water body and land in between. The fly area associated with the approval is restricted to the 1,000 feet as indicated by the applicant. Operating schedule, um, operation, operating month shall be May to September. Operating days shall be Saturday and Sunday only, no statutory holidays. And then, I'm leaving the hours of operations up to council's discretion, as well as what time a quiet time shall commence should they permit the events on site. There is no provision to extend the operating schedule. Personnel on site, the site shall have a member of the Rocky Barnstormers Association on site at all times. During events, additional personnel may be permitted on site um, from other model airplane clubs to view or watch the event. And C, the number of personnel permitted on site during events sh shall be restricted to that number. Condition five is parking. Any parking associated with the operation sh shall be located on site between the southeast water body and the south property boundary. This includes the recreational vehicles. No other area is permitted with this, with this approval. Um, six is signage, so barnstormers shall have the site signed with their contact information. Waste management, um, ensure that they have portable washrooms on site, hand washing station, as well as garbage bins in order to comply with Alberta Health Services. Other approvals is condition eight, so the proposed development may be subject to provincial and federal approvals and any approvals shall be um, submitted to Clearwater County's planning department. 
And condition nine is additional conditions. So should concerns be erased at a later date that we would have the right to um, put on more conditions or revoke the permit if required. So that would be if we were to approve the application. If council was leaning to refuse the applications, um, what administration would recommend would be, as per the Municipal Development Plan 1426, that the proposed location is not suitable for the following reasons. A, the location of land is in close proximity to a residential multi-lot subdivision, and B, the noise associated with the operation would pose nuisance factors to neighboring lands. I know Rocky Barnstormers would like to speak to this application, um, so I'm gonna turn the floor over to them, but happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Okay. Like to, thank you, Ms. Bailey. Um, so with that, um, I'll, there's, I, there's no blinky lights, so go ahead and, 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 and your submission, and this is the one that you've <coughs> just given us that you're going to reference, correct? Okay. Well, I, I wrote this, uh, this letter that I yeah. put before you uh, before I saw Holly's comments. So some are maybe redundant or, or done twice, but anyway, um, I would suggest that you, uh, while I'm reading this, if you have a question, just mark the paragraph and I'll answer them all at the end. And maybe uh, the question may be answered later in the letter. So yeah. this, this won't take long, it's in fairly large print. So hello, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors. My name is Ray Brasinski, and I would like to give a brief history of our club. I'm one of the founding members of the Barnstormers. The club was established in April of 82. That was 42 years ago to a growing need for a safe place to fly our radio controlled aircraft. A few fellows were flying off the apron of the Rocky Airport, but the water bombers asked if they could we could, they could find another place to fly as they needed the space for their activities. We leased four acres from Burdignoli's, use only three, but have room to expand if we need to fly jets. We have flown jets at the our airfield, but a little more room would be better. We don't feel too guilty walking into the farmer's crop to re retrieve a down plane. He actually gets a, a free acre from us. The club has grown from an initial 12 members to a high of 59 members. Our store brought 15 to 20 new members every year to the club, but some left each year as they moved and built their own airport, died, or <laughs> lost interest. Our members have reduced to a stable 15, 20 since we sold our store. Some come and go depending on their circumstances. Our initial members were Dr. Terry Layden, the Bank of Nova Scotia manager, and his son. Bob Kutzer from Rogers Garage, Gary Mandrusiak, Forestry Operations Manager, Jerry DeWitt, Morris Scali from the Rocky Flying Club, Morris also supervised oil field turnarounds, George Kemper, Control Calibrations, a few others, and me. I was manager of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, Silver Lake at the time. A bunch of people, a good bunch of people. We had about 30 members the following year and the club grew steadily until we closed our store to retire in 2004. Our club taught hundreds of radio control pilots over the years. Some were full scale. We refer to them as full scale, one to one scale or 100% scale as they have to climb into their plane to fly it. We stand with our feet on the ground and fly the plane around. All is well flying away from you, but it's all backwards coming back to you. It takes a little practice. Every year I'm stopped by a, <clears throat> a father or grandfather, proud of his son, grandson, who is taking lessons for full scale and or airline pilot. We provided the inspiration. Full scale pilots can continue their flying experience with the club at much lower costs. We flew New Year's Day for many years and did again this past January. We call it our polar fun fly. In the past, we used to fly all winter when it was warm enough. Our clubhouse has heaters. We used, to, we used to plow our field with our own plow and an old truck. Alas, the interest waved and if, to a few, and so we sold the truck and the plow and relied on our friends to plow it on New Year's. 
I wear some of us fly in the winter in the high school gym to keep our eyes sharp and fingers nimble. Occasionally, we score a couple of points by making a basket like Pastor Bill Cronin did this year. <laughs> anyway, all our members belong to Model Aeronautics Association of Canada, who is in its 75th year. MAC provides each member with 10 million, that increased from 75, 10 million this year, public liability insurance per occurrence. To fly, everyone must be a member of MAC. MAC is a member of the Aero Club of Canada who, is, who has membership in the Federation Avionatic International FAI. Nearly 100 countries are in FAI. Aero Club of Canada has the balloonist, rocketist, full-scale acrobatics, sailplanes, rotorcraft, parachute, MAC, and more. Through MAC, if you're good enough, you can find your way to international competition. Canada does well at these events. MAC also provides rules, protects our frequencies, and helps us keep our flying sites. Long distance. <clears throat> we branched into long distance where you have a buddy drive a vehicle and a pilot flights, flies the plane. We flew from the Rimby Club a distance of 55, 60 miles. It took about a quarter, one and a quarter to one and a half hours to make the trip. Most added another fuel tank or stopped to refuel. It was a lot of fun, and we did it for about 20 years. The best year was seven teams. Five made it to the club field okay, one made it to the ball diamonds, and one landed near the Burger Baron. Apparently, some, par some Americans fly all around Staten Island, New York, sitting in a boat. Valley of Hope Fun Fly, hosted by Will, one of our members, he is a full-scale pilot who allows us to use his runway and facility for a fun fly. It is a week-long event with a potluck supper on Saturday night. We charge $5 per person who has a most delicious meal. Those are collected and given to STARS Air Ambulance each year. Will has estimated that over the 20 years of doing this, that we have given STARS I stand corrected, it's 30 years, and it gives roughly $500 a year, so my figure is on the low side. It should be around 15000 that Will has donated to STARS. For the past few years, our club has provided an aeronautic, aeronautics course at the grade six students at Pioneer School. Also, Will provided his airplane to give students a ride under the COPA program at the Innisfail Airport for the past few years. That brings me to flying off water. This event has its own challenges. You must fly perfectly into the, the wind to take off and land the same way. If you don't, your float catches, you flip, and you look like a duck with your tail up in the air. For all our events, we have a rescue boat, and it doesn't matter how well your engine runs, it can decide to quit on the water. Our models are fairly large with a seven-foot wingspan being the average. That's average. Some larger, some smaller. Smaller. <laughs> One of our members has a twin otter of 11 foot wingspan, which is roughly another foot on the two feet, seven, four, two feet wider than that. Seven, yeah, two feet. Uh, uh, others larger, others smaller. Uh, one, one of our members has an 11 foot otter with 11 foot wingspan. Okay, and there's a few others come with nine foot spans. Others have electric and smaller planes. One fellow from Red Deer can make his plane go backwards. It's great for getting out of weeds at the shore. Derek, model, uh, Derek Levitt had a model of the Mars water bomber, which is state, a state anchored at Spruit Lake on Vancouver Island. Unfortunately, Derek's plane got behind some trees and was destroyed. It had a wingspan of 15 feet. We need a pond much bigger than a dugout. A pond of about 20 acres in area is great, 600 feet wide by 1,200 feet or thereabouts. Gravel pits or lakes are fine, except lakes have fishermen, and they get in the way. Twin Lakes, we flew off Twin Lakes for 25 years, renting the whole group campground on the south side. 
When we started, there was no one camp there before the May long weekend or after the September long weekend. We were alone on the lake. But as time progressed, the weather warmed a bit and people began camping in warmer accommodations, like from tents to trailers. We called our spring event the icebreaker fun fly. Couple the ice, couple of times the ice was still there, so we took our boat, mine, and cut the ice into strips. Next morning, the ice was gone. The activity on the lake started earlier in the year and went later. Then they stocked the lake with more fish and we found ourselves flying around fishermen. The lake became congested, unsuitable for our needs anymore. Around the time, that time, I looked at the county map and seeing that Stewart's Pit was all water, I went to inspect it and it was all gravel, no water. Derek Level found, Derek Level, Levitt found a large body of water north of Leslieville with his airplane. Upon contacting the owner, he said, we may use the slough, but it's very shallow, and by the end of June, it is overgrown with weeds. Your boat won't get through it. Derek then flew over Graham Perry's abandoned and reclaimed clear water gravel pit. It was about 1,000 feet by 1,200 feet with a usable flight area of 600 to 1,200, about 20 acres. Perfect. The water was 11 to 13 feet deep, so the weeds don't make it to the surface. We also had an area of over 20 campers. We also had an area for over 20 campers, but only around 10 to 12 usually came. It was a beautiful place, and we thought we were in heaven. We gave Graham an honorarium, advising the dates we needed for the pond for ne the next year. Everybody is happy. However, after 13 years, Graham decided to sell his property. The new buyer advised he was going to build a house there, telling us we couldn't use the pond anymore. Sorry. For a while, we looked at Cooper's Pit, but the county said that they had from five to 10 years of excavating to do yet. I took a walk around the site and agreed. They drained the whole lake to extract the gravel every year. I asked if they could just leave the water where we fly. They said, that's not impossible, and they weren't Moses. So we may look at this site in the future. So I was out scouting for some dried dead, dead willow I used for smoking my sausage when I came across Stewart's gravel pad again, owned by Mervyn Paderni. It was perfect for our needs. There is ample route for pilot stations, flying area, parking, camping for a dozen units. There is a large grass area and no trees. The south end of Stewart's Pit is at least a half mile from the nearest residence. All the residents are near Highway 11 and would hear its traffic before hearing any of our planes. They would hear their neighbor's lawnmower before us. Besides, we would be using the pit for only two weekends a year. Our meetings are spent, our evenings are spent around the campfire. I bring my guitar, Rob from Red Deer brings his, as well as Grant from Olds brings his. We have a little music, a bit of socializing, and retire fairly early. We used to have more f water fun flies around, like Sylvan Lake, Gull Lake, Paddle River, and Cold Lake. As far as I know, the only the the one at Clear Lake, west of Barhead, and ours are the only ones left in Alberta. We really want to keep our ours going, as our members have invested a lot of time and funds into this type of flying. Shushwap in BC is another huge water fun fly twice a year. They actually, can't, they actually rent the whole campground and have their water fly. Uh, so they do that twice a year and before May long weekend, of course, and after the September long weekend. Gravel Pit allows us to move our water events later in the spring and earlier in the fall. This allows our members to attend the Shushwap and Clear Lake events, so we can get out to the other guys's. If anyone is concerned that we may be noisy, I'd like to tell you of our past record. All the campers across at Twin Lakes listened to our planes across the lake. Not one complaint. We had a few visitors and spectators. At Graham Perry's Pond, we had four residences within a half a mile plus all the residents of Echo Canyon subdivision. Not one complaint. We had a few visitors and spectators. We had to put up with the smells of the asphalt plant of the county of 
with Tasquin occasionally as they were kitty corner from us. They paved the road west of Bentley and Gull Lake. We have our main field south, half mile south of Rocky for over 40 years. Very early in our tenure, we had a neighbor appreciation day. We invited some 25 residents that are within a half a mile. You won't believe that, but they were 25. We invited them for coffee to stop, park off the road, and watch us fly. Often it got us from air chair, armchair flying to show off a bit. We have good neighbors. All of the neighbors near Stewart's pit are welcome to visit our functions and see our planes fly. It is always free, and we encourage it. As stated in our correspondence, we're not after money, only permission to use the waters of Stewart's Pit and then for only two weekends. We might squeeze in another day on the weekends. We, are always, we always set up a rescue boat and a handicapped porta potty. That's probably why we only have two events a year because it's a bit of work to do. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, thank you for your patience. Any questions? Thank you. So looking at that, questions, uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff? Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, in in your correspondence to us, you're saying that it was only for two weekends. Then why is the development permit being requested? Then what? It, then why is the development permit being requested to be open, at an, for all weekends, not just the two weekends in which you wish to fly? Well, uh, it's in case they were to use the water on other weekends when there is an event occurring. Okay, thank you. If we we can then juggle our event dates that way. But really, in the past, all we ever done was two weekends a year. We never went out to Twin Lakes in the middle of summer. I mean, from a safety perspective, that was not safe. Way too many people around there. Yeah. You don't want to fly around boats, and we like to be safe. So, yeah, all we ever had was two, two weekends. Like you say, if you went out there on your own, you'd have to bring your own dinghy or be a darn good swimmer. I'm not aware of that ever happening, though. No. No, we didn't do that. Okay. Councilor Ratcliffe? Okay. Just to confirm then, what, what you're, you're asking for here is permission to use it on for two events, but you, you don't, can't specify the dates. So you want flexibility in the dates? Exactly. Um, uh, we've had the event on Mother's Day occasionally. Um, we tested that out, see if that was okay, and it seemed to be. Um, uh, other, uh, other groups have events in Alberta. There's a big one in Red Deer, uh, one at Leduc. There's people in Calgary, Edmonton. Uh, not, not all of them come. Maybe one in a while, a uh, couple guys from Leduc. You know, so we, we, we also see, we also see what other groups are doing before we schedule our events. Okay. You know. Usually after a while though, once you kind of pick your dates, you kind of leave it there because other clubs try to work around you as well. So we're a little bit limbo now because we haven't had anything in a few years because we lost Perry Pond. So, but usually it's spring and fall. So that's kind of how we try to schedule. So, okay. you know, to give you an, we have some dates picked for this year, if it'll work. So, but, uh, yeah, so that's something we try to work around. We usually have a, a, a meeting in November. We get our new directorate, and then we schedule our events for the following year. So this is done in November. We have a national magazine where we put our events in it so that everybody in Canada actually knows where you know, our events. So sometimes they schedule their events around us. Ms. Bealy? I was just gonna get Ray to clarify, you put in your request to who for your events? Sorry? Who do you put your request into for your events, for the dates of your events? That would be posted to Mac. Yeah, we, we, we decide ourselves when what our, what our dates are for our events. And then we post it in Mac. And they have to approve those dates? They approve them, yeah. And the site. We have to send a site plan in to get our 10 million coverage. 
you send a site plan in where everybody stands to keep your distances all proper. Otherwise, we don't have insurance. Yeah. Like, I don't fly where there's no insurance. Yeah. Like we have to, there's, there is a flight line which will probably be the shore of the water. Okay. Now, parking, parking spectators, all that stuff is 100 feet back of that line. And all the flying is done from the flight line forward. You cannot fly it behind the flight line because that is risky. You know, if, if, uh, okay. Okay. Got a couple more if anything questions. should go wrong, it's going to be out there, not back here. For sure. Okay. Uh, Councillor Lougheed? Thank you. And just, just for um, everybody's, everybody that's listening, uh, just, just to say that I was a member of, member of this club for many years and, and fully aware of, of the, the challenges around um, of offering a, a club that, that deals with model aircraft. But I would say, I think you, you gentlemen are very modest in saying that you've had uh, a 40 year record. You have a 40 year exemplary record of, of bringing uh, an activity, a hobby to many, many people. And I, I, I can say personally how much that benefited my, my life, my family's life, and I uh, built uh, many lifelong friends. Uh, sitting on the executive at one time on that, I know that when you were looking at uh, the spring fun for Waterfly, uh, you quite often chose an alternate date. Would it be fair to say that these events are somewhat weather dependent and you need to have some alternate times picked out as well? Yes. yes um, it hasn't happened too much but we have delayed one a week. But, uh, but most times we have one or two days one that in a weekend that we do actually fly. So we're quite happy with that. If we get out there, fly and... Okay. I don't think we post postponed an event in the, I can't remember the last time we would have done that because once you pick, you know, everybody's kind of geared up to it. If it rains, well, tough luck. But usually we stick with what we picked. Yeah. Yeah. Just otherwise it throws everything else kind of kitty wonkers. Is that good? And and maybe as a supplementary, even even if there was a day that was less favorable for flying, it's also a social social event where you can look at the work that people have done in in constructing. I mean, there's a lot of skill and talent that goes into constructing these planes and seeing and fellowshipping with and reacquainting with the other friends in the hobby as well. Yeah, you have friends from Calgary, Red Deer, uh, Leduc, uh, Olds, that comes. I mean, it's, you're right, it's, it's quite social. Um, we're, we're, we're happy that way. We're, you know, we've made a lot of good friends. Okay. And we share building experiences, you know. Mm -hmm. For sure. Deputy Reeve Milhoff, and then I'll go to Councilor Graham. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, you had mentioned that it's flight line forward. Um, on page 66, uh, Ms. Beely, does that mean that these um, circle radiuses may not actually be accurate because the flight line was mentioned that it would be the water? Um, are those not necessarily then accurate? I, I didn't draw them, I'm sorry. Yeah, no <laughs> Looking at what you have there, yeah, you would never fly there. If I call that south, if the top is north, call it, no, you would never fly there. Okay. Everything has so to be forward. Line. Flight, line, flight line is here. Flying is that way. Camping, camping and uh, uh, spectator area, parking is all on this green area. Now it may happen, or the earth may drain that way. I don't know if this one will drain as well. No, uh, that is not. Okay, <laughs> go, go ahead, Ms. Bailey. My understanding was when they took off and landed, um, I did the thousand foot radius on either end of the wet pit to give you a general idea of what the thousand foot flying area would look like. I did not factor in the flight line or the pilot yes. line. These are a thousand feet? Yes. Yeah. Nobody working in the pit, 
That's correct. So they, it, it would be safe to fly over there. You're not going to damage a gravel pile. <laughs> so move the circle slightly north, but I just just so you had a general idea that they weren't going to be flying over the residential sites um, or too much of the neighboring lands. That's where I was trying to they're not outline. Going to be on the far end of the circle all mm -hmm. the time. It's yep. going to be most most guys are just fly back and forth, back and forth over here, and they'll take off the land and then do their thing. Thank so you. so full disclosure, I for 15 years, uh, uh, t two weekends a year, I got to watch. Uh, I lived. I live above the the area at the at the at the pit, the Perry Pit. So uh, I got to hear, I got to see, and enjoy from a from a distance. <laughs> and so I can uh, personally attest that yes, you guys are there on the weekends. You guys are uh, rain or shine. Um, sometimes, like you say, when it's rain, um, uh, I understand that you know it's more of a fellowship thing. Um, I agree, there's never been a complaint and with, with all that you're doing down there and I know how expensive this little hobby can be because I've seen some of the, <laughs> some of the pilots that, uh, um, th that build these. So anyways, with that, so um, totally understand your, your area of flight for myself. So I understand that you don't go, don't go too, venture too far and in that. So it's more about uh, control. Uh, Councilor Graham, I said that we'll go next. It sounds like you guys have a wonderful club. I love the that it's a family thing and fathers and sons and hopefully there's some some mothers and daughters in there too. And it's really cool that you guys go out to Pioneer School as well to, to teach kids. It would be cool if you guys expanded that to Charlotte Small School as well. I'm sure they would be really eager to learn about your club and you could find some new awesome members. Um, my question is more toward the permit, the development permit. Can we clarify in it that it's only for the two weekends? Because I understand the concerns of the residents there, and and to be quite frank, coming into this, I was thinking, no, it should be a different location, but knowing it's only two weekends, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's fair. So if we can just clarify that in the development permit for the residents to alleviate their concerns. Yeah, I'm just really happy with that. I just want to confirm, Ray, that you understand that when they do that, there's no flying in that site at all outside of those weekends. Thank you. Okay. We were able to uh, to have one additional event when we first started at at um, Ferry Pond. Uh, you you had one there. There was there was three events, but uh, yeah, only that one time. Yeah. So so we've been doing that for 38 years. We've been happy with that, and uh, I, why shouldn't we not be? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, Ms. Beely, is, is there any precedence for allowing um, public to be inside a um, active aggregate extraction area? I didn't come across any restrictions to that. I think there, if there is, um, they're way aware on like the PP or having equipment there. Is there in there when there's no operations on the site? How, how does that work with Paderni's safety certification that they are required to have in order to have an active aggregate license with the province? I am not sure how that works. Um, Ray might be able to speak more to that. Okay, what, what's the question? Kit. Is there any restrictions for you guys um, operating in a site that has an active gravel pit? None, um, none that I'm aware. I could confirm with Paderni's. Yeah, I've got Mervyn's permission verbally and then also in writing, I mean, that we can do this. I, and I, I understand that, but we, we just approved um, gravel extraction in the area um, and they obviously have to have a safety certification in order to have a provincial um, aggregate extraction license. Yeah. And I just don't want this permit to affect that permit. So it's always good to double check everything. Um, well... The, your question. So you're wondering if Mac would actually have a problem with us flying in a gravel pit. I'm no. actually wondering if Paderni safety certification would come into question with them allowing public access to the gravel pit. 
Okay, from that point. Okay, gotcha. We have this $10 million worth of public liability insurance uh, also. So if there's any, any cause for concern, uh, um, shouldn't be any. And, th and then the owner gave permission. That's all MAC requires. Okay. Um, yeah. Councillor Lougheed, then I'll go to Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you. Thank you, Reeve Swanson. Maybe it might help to just kind of outline some of the events. I, I know in the past that um, the club has been very um, protective of, of keeping the flight area safe and not allowing the public to wander onto areas of danger. I mean, I think you have an extremely good safety record with the public. Um, maybe if you could just outline, you know, that I don't see this particular application opening the entire pit up to people wandering around unless it was to recover an aircraft or something like that. No, there'll be, there'll be signage at, at the gate and there'll be a signage where you drive off the road and pointing toward where we are. So any anyone that comes there and, and we, we've giving an invite to anybody that lives out there to come and visit us. So when they do, we, uh, we, we provide them where the line is that there's nobody goes beyond this point. There's a sign for that. And if they do, if they do somebody right away walks with them and so the little kids, they, they'll run right to an airplane, poke a hole in it just as fast as you can say, gosh darn, you know. <laughs> I had that happen uh, on a native reserve once uh, to me. So I had to give a quarter to somebody to go around and get some scotch tape. But <laughs> so uh, we did a demo there once. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. I know the rules around remotely piloted aircraft have gotten much more stringent. Yes. The proliferation of drones. Uh, how has that affected your operations? Well, uh, we say we can only fly those drones. Now, when we talk, when I talk about a drone, it's a drone. It's not an airplane. It's one of those little things with four propellers on it and buzzes around. But the part, uh, the, the, what do you call that? The flying people, the uh, government people, they call these things drones because they actually, they, they actually fly these drones around, uh, say in the, in the Black Sea, uh, the U.S. is keeping an eye on what's going on there. It's an airplane, but they call it a drone. But the, the uh, federal aviation, what do you call that thing? Uh, the, uh, Are you talking about NAV Canada? Uh, okay, yeah. so maybe I can answer that for you. Yes, we have to have kind of sort of a pilot's license now. And you do that online, it costs you 10 bucks. And you, you, do an, you do a form, you have to fill it out. If you score high enough, you get your license for two years. If you want to fly with Mac, half that insurance, you got to have that license. So when we fly at my farm now, even though I'm not allowed to ask, because I'm not an RCMP, neither am I an immigration officer, or anybody of authority that can ask for that license. But my friends are good to me, and they say, well, we know it's not you. We'll show you our license anyways. So I see the license, and we wouldn't operate this any different. We got to see that. So make sure you have the license, because you don't have the license, you don't have the insurance. Okay, so you gotta be licensed, and these things have to be registered now. And uh, you don't see a number on that one right now, that's my little electric, because we haven't had, since these new regulations came in, we haven't had an event. So I haven't registered that airplane yet. But if we have an event, I will register that airplane, put a sticker on it, that way it's traceable. So yes, we do try to apply, by, uh, abide by all those rules, because if we do not, we do not have insurance. They so we're kind of pretty strict about that. Myself, from a landowner's point of view, so I can appreciate Murph Penherney giving us permission to fly there from his point of view, but we want to make sure we 
protect him as well. And by following all the rules and such, that makes it, you know, a whole lot safer. Yeah. When I, when I talked to Mervyn, he gave us the verbal ap approval and I asked him if he wanted his name on the insurance certificate, you know, the uh, landowner. He said, oh no, that's fine. He's, he was good with that. Uh, Deputy Reeves, Uh Thank you, thank you, Reeves. Um, Ms. Feely, are we opening up a can of worms, for lack of a, of a better term for this, by allowing public access into this pit? What is to stop us then from setting precedents for then happening to allow public access into all pits? I'm Mr. Yeah. yeah. If I may, it would be the difference for Clearwater County. This is a private pit, therefore a private individual say so in his acceptance of liability. Um, going back, if I may, uh, your, your question regarding safety. Uh, two different processes, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. So you apply to one level of government for the approval to mine, and that dictates how you mine. That's an end land use and sequential mining and sequential reclamation. The other aspect of legislation is occupational health and safety, both the act and code. That dictates the work, how it's done, and it has to be done in a safe manner. There's trenching, excavating, and that legislation. Um, so that's the part of legislation where Padernes would have to mitigate if the two activities coexisted. Um, so if that helps there, and regarding the current question, Given it's a private pit, it's his acceptance to accept the liability. Um, I would suggest Clearwater County being a public entity, we would be accepting a liability for the ratepayers of Clearwater County. Puts us in a different situation than a private individual. Um, this body's making decisions on behalf of all our ratepayers. So it, every pit would be looked at differently and site specific because the safety measures have to be taken into account for every individual site. Um, Ray and I did sit and have a few meetings about Cooper Pit. We're now about five years away from completing that pit. Um, because we're at the end stage, we are dewatering to clean up the pit floor and we have to dewater to also reclaim. You can't just slope in the water. Um, so we will be in that level of activities to finalize. Um, I would suggest when we're reclaimed, um, an application to public lands would be very appropriate because they're the landowner, we're not. We're only leasing the site, if, if that helps. That's what I mean. Every, every pit is so individual, uh, Deputy Reeve, that you have to look at each one. There. <laughs> uh, so what is the difference between gravel pits and uh, lakes? Lake, Twin Lakes, Crimson Lake, Sylvan Lake, all those lakes. I've flown off about 10 different lakes with my plane. I didn't ask permission. Didn't have to. No. But everybody gets more concerned, I guess. I don't know. Go ahead. Mr. Emmons. No, nope. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so to address the question, Ray, if I may. Yeah. Um, th truly, the difference is permits. Um, mm -hmm. You have a permit to mine and create a gravel, to actively mine a gravel pit. Um, that permit is very decisive in what it's for, mm -hmm. and it doesn't include flying. Um, so for Clearwater County, by our permit, we're not even supposed to bring in a load of gravel into the pit <laughs> because it's for mining only. It, it's that restrictive I see yeah so we're governed under a higher level of government that gives us an approval for an activity I see okay a subsequent question deputy reef yes thank you um, I, I do recognize mr. Emmons that this is a private pit however we are the development authority so I think it's important that we look at every angle of this which is why I'm digging as deep into this as, as I am um, the process for direct control district zoning, this was the first pit that we actually had transitioned into direct control. 
um, allowed for a public hearing um, to take place. Was the public aware that they should also be um, bringing comments uh, regarding potential aircraft in that area when they were bringing con uh, comments to council um, on that direct control district hearing? Ms. Bailey? We outlined to the public that um, this land was going to be zoned direct control and what the district, the purpose of the district is. Specifically aircraft, no. But um, it would be presented to council for a decision and they would have an opportunity to comment on that because we circulate referral letters for any proposal that occurs in a DC district. But not to be able to comment on the public hearing when they had the opportunity to address the direct control district because that was not proposed at that time. The that used, airplanes, the airport, yes, the airplane they was, was not, not proposed. proposed at that time. But they had opportunity to comment on the referral circulated for this particular application. Thank you. Okay. Any further comments or questions to the development officer? And, or to the, uh, go ahead, Mr. Cermak, Council Cermak. Maybe I'm way out of line here, but nowhere in any of this information, and I know that uh, one of the gentlemen said that he has a written statement stating that the owner of this land said it was fine to do that. Nowhere in any of this paperwork I've seen anything stating that. Go ahead. Sorry, yes, staff does have that um, information in the file. Just in the council report, I just put um, information that I thought would be more relevant for the application, but I didn't include his letter, but they do have it. Okay, so it is so legal that the landowner knows all about it, and he's fine and happy with it all and everything. Yeah, whenever there is a company that owns a piece of property, there's a corporate signing authority form that we have them sign up or sign, and that's what um, Ray did have them fill out. Great. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Brzezinski. Oh, I push a button. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some 40 years ago, I, when I came to town, I did work for Mervyn. I worked in his office for about five years. I, I know the gentleman well. He's a man of his word. Um, and and hopefully I am. Uh, we did have a, I, I simply phoned him. He said, uh, certainly, but he says, go see the county because, he didn't say because, he said, see the county though. And here I am. Uh, Holly made me get it in writing and his writing is notarized. <laughs> I think I made about six trips out to his office. He, he, he uh, winters in uh, California, as you know. So, yes, uh, we, have, it, it, we have his full cooperation. Yeah, I just did not see any of the paperwork. Oh, oh you didn't I see it. I to verify it. Yeah, of so course. it is there. Of course. Yeah. I've known Merv for 75 years. Oh, so. okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I agree with uh, Deputy Reed Melhoff. I'm just wondering if we're setting a precedent in regards to an active pit. Um, I understand, yes, we have the, the landowner's permission. Um, I also have read the, the letters of concern in this as well, which I would like to, um, I understand their letter, their, their concerns of this. And I have, again, listened to these fellows for 15 years, so I know the sites, the, the, you know, seeing, hearing, I know they keep, they've done a lot of mowing. They, they kept it very clean. Um, there was never, ever concerned um, with them being there. But I'd like to also make sure that if we are going to do any kind of a approval, it's that they have to let the residents know, these are the dates, these are the dates. Um, like, you have to let the area know and however that seemed fit, and maybe it's an ad in the paper to say we are going to be in at this particular thing, I don't know, or it's a letter out to, to the residents. Because I think having, if they want to disappear that weekend, not, not listen, it's, it's totally up to them. Um, but again, thank you for clarifying about the licenses, because I was wondering about that as well, because we do want to make sure that um, uh, there's no 
unintended consequences from some of this that happens. So uh, I see two more lights. I'll go to Councillor Ratcliffe and I'll go to Councillor Lott. Thank you, Reeve. Um, I also heard the neighbor's concerns as uh, these people are my neighbors um, uh, about this being every weekend, but as it's now clarified as being only two events a year, uh, I would make the motion that council uh, grant permission to development permit 23 slash 24 to allow the use of uh, this pit for on two events with uh, advance notice to the community, the multi-lot subdivision to the north. Okay, if I may, anything please, else? Um, I would just like to, I don't know if this is appropriate, but could I recommend um, amendments to their condition then at this time, if there's already a motion on the floor? Mm -hmm. I would just restrict in condition one the scope of the operations and um, the operating schedule. I would recommend that you restrict it to two weekends a year. And then I would recommend an additional condition that notice is given to adjacent landowners um, two weeks, minimum of two weeks prior to an event. And generally that's a letter that's sent out to the adjacent landowners and the county's planning department. Okay, uh, I'll speak to the motion. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Lowry. Um, if, if it pleases <laughs> Council, um, since Councillor Ratcliffe beat me to the motion, I would propose an amendment that would encapsulate what uh, Development Officer Bealey just uh, stated as well. Okay. And I would maybe just add that uh, I think as we use our municipal development plan as a guidance tool, especially when we're dealing with a direct control district. I need, think we need to find that balance between recreational opportunities, economic, uh, tourism, those things that we have defined as very important. And this definitely is one of those things that has, has enhanced, or this club's activities has enhanced that in our community before. And balancing that off, that this is repurposing something in that Thing. I mean, you would never look at a gravel pit as a recreational opportunity. This is actually following some of those guidelines within our MDP that encourages a, a wider spectrum of recreational uses on, on property as well. So I think maybe that is could be part of Council's consideration in this motion as well. Yeah. So friendly amendment as per Ms. Uh, Ms. Bealey's recommendation, be, if that's I think acceptable. That, okay, that is acceptable. Changing the overall design. Yeah. Friendly amendment adding, is specifics to the conditions think, already. Was, was the motion not basically on the line of recommendation one that was mm -hmm. recommend approval with suggested conditions? And the, I, I believe administration suggested some additions, and that's what I was motioning if, if we want to do it and vote There's on the amendment. I don't have an issue with yeah. that. You guys are considering mm -hmm. a friendly Okay, um, I have a, a question in this it is how many members do you currently have? Somewhere between 15 and 20. Okay. Uh, they come and go. Right. Yeah. So, so that's, that seems to be the habit. Yeah. Okay. Just, okay. They don't all fly. No. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> they're there in person. Yeah. So I do have a comment if, yeah. if I may. Um, the, I was looking at the Cooper pit, and there they were telling me that in five years the, the pit will be reclaimed and there'll be camping spots made and it'll be in a recreation area and, and all of this. Um, doesn't this fit in that, in that um, scheme of things? We could, our club, uh, uh, hobby, sport, would love to fly there when you get it all done. So, okay. with, so my question now for administration, if it, like knowing that the future is possibility, can we put a time frame on this development permit as well, or is it basically open ended? You guys can put any conditions you'd like on this development application. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Deputy Reeve Mohawk. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I agree. Um, in fact, I actually reached out to Ms. Beely when I first saw this application and say, hey, what about the Cooper pay? Because <laughs> it that's literally the, the goal of it. Um, but it's not reclaimed yet, as is, this is not reclaimed yet either. But I 100% agree. When the Cooper plate is, is reclaimed, I would encourage um, you to work with our, our uh, planning department, and they could actually probably work with you and public lands to actually make some of those approvals start the process um, on that. I think, I think that would be a great use of, use of that for community engage and, uh, enjoyment. Councillor Northcott. Um, just for an additional condition to maybe be added if it's not on there, but just to include that there be proper liability insurance and licensing for flight of the aircraft as a condition. Go ahead. Yep. Oh, just as an additional condition. Okay. Um, just to, to have proof of uh, a current li like liability coverage, insurance oh, coverage, and we, 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 licensing. On site. Yes, when we when we do this, we uh, check virtually the, the, his card that he has in insurance. But just as a condition, so that it's active. I could add it into condition eight other approvals. Okay. Uh, Holly, to make your life easier, if you just put in there, all flyers have to apply by all MAC rules. That would kind of cover. cover what you're looking for here. Yeah. And another thing, um, one of the complaints was cattle and flying airplanes around cattle. So I've been a cow guy here for 45 years. The planes fly there and the cows are behind the wall behind an electric fence. They don't care. So I, at least my cows never did. So I, you know, I can maybe put some mind at ease there. We've, been, we've never heard or hit a bird. I've heard stories where an eagle went and got a little sailplane and took it up to his nest, but you know, the, air, the birds around are quite safe. We, you try and you can't hit them. It's impossible. We don't try. No. <laughs> All right. We, we, we give up right away. All right. Motion on the floor. So uh, go, uh, any um, discussion on the motion? Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I absolutely uh, admire what your what your group does for the community. Um, I hope that you continue to do that. Um, I would actually ask that if you wanted us to advocate for you to be able to access um, the airport again, um, we can uh, potentially work on trying to get you airport access. Um, unfortunately for me, um, I represent that that particular area. Um, those those residents, you've 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 read the letters, I'm sure, and I also don't agree that we should be allowing access, public access, to an active gravel operation. Unfortunately, I just don't. Um, if this was a reclaimed pit, this could be a different conversation, but it is partially reclaimed, and it is still an active gravel pit. Um, so for me today, this would be this would be a no. Um, but I would encourage you to work with our planning department to find another location. I really, I think that what you're doing is great and it's a fabulous opportunity for families and yourselves to, um, to do. Councillor Cermak? Yeah, I'm still confused on uh, the amendment to the motion. Okay. Is all of these uh, conditions that uh, Holly had, had put down here, the nine, are they included? Yes. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yes. With the addition of uh, two weeks notice of communication and uh, two events a year. Yeah. And, 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 and then, yes, all covered under insurance of the MAC. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Councillor Northcott. Just to, <clears throat> for, the, for these two events that you would fly for the year, it would be on the weekends. And at, during the weekends, the pit is not operational. Is that correct? So it would be a not, there's no active work being done in the pit at that time, okay? That's okay. correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff? Thank you, Reeve. Um, when do they plan their uh, two-week, 24-hour crush? Go ahead, Ms. Beeler. Pedernes has not provided that information. So there's no way of knowing if this, if the two-week, 24-hour uh, crush would not coincide with um, this potential event? That's right. Thank you. Would it not be at the discretion of the pit owner 
of the dates, like they would have priority over the dates that uh, they allow the barnstormers to? That would be my assumption, that yeah. their gravel would take precedence. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Northcott. Okay. Would, would we be able to just add that as one additional condition that the two organizations, like the two groups, wouldn't be able to operate at the same time? You would ensure that the current operations of the gravel pit would be inactive. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Yes. If we fly by MAC rules, we can fly when there's operation going on. That that would stop it right there. Excellent. If there's people out there, we're done. Yep. Okay. Mr. Brzezinski? Same time we can fly over houses or or golfers or, you know. Okay. Uh, there something else, well. Fishermen. <laughs> People that chase white balls around. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, if not, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Those opposed? And that motion is carried. Thank you very much for bringing in your, de your development permit, gentlemen, and uh, we'll work towards uh, other solutions in the future, too. I think so. If it works well, thank you for coming in. Thank you very much for your time. You and, and, talk a little bit, really appreciate it. Thank and, and thank you. Uh, we'll work with uh, Holly on how to notify those people. Please. Uh, Please. That's the only th new thing that we got to do. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, looking at the agenda now, we are moving into corporate services at uh, six point two. The 2024 annual communications update. And sir, we need to recess this so they can get their plans. Yes, and we'll take a five minute Sorry. recess. Yep. <laughs>
and welcome back. We have just taken a quick break again. Uh, we're now at 6.2 at uh, the 2024 Annual Communications Update. I'll turn the floor over to Ms. DJ Tutek. Thank you, Reeve. Thank you, Council. So as Council may recall, in 2022, Council was presented with a strategic communications plan that Council had approved. Um, and it's re re renewed um, every, uh, with every Council strategic plan. To ensure that the strategic uh, communications plan remains relevant, it should be reviewed on an annual basis with an annual summary report of the progress is made towards achieving the results uh, presented to Council during the first half of the year, approximately around the first quarter. So this presentation will cover highlights, very brief highlights of 2023, an amendment to the current strategic communications plan um, that is valid from 2023 to 2026, and it will reflect um, moving the Citizen Satisfaction Survey from 2025 to 2024. And the following reasons um, for moving that survey are is to avoid conflict with project schedules in 2025 when the potential county and village of Caroline amalgamation is anticipated to take place. And to ensure the council has sufficient time to review current satisfaction levels with the community before the next municipal election. The goal of the survey is to increase engagement with the community, gain insight into resident perceptions and satisfactions with county services and programs. The results will help inform council and assist with setting project priorities for the upcoming years. The survey would run this spring through an online format with paper copies made available at various locations throughout the community. The survey uh, summary of findings will be reported back to council. The survey would be coordinated with a consultant uh, that will be working closely with the communications team to ensure that there are unbiased questions and that thorough data, data analysis is completed. The cost will be covered through the approved 2024 communications budget. And this change is noted on the last page of the strategic communications plan under evaluations. So I'll start off with just a brief overview of the plan, um, starting off with the role of corporate communications, our goals that we've outlined, our strategies and tools, uh, and then that will tie into all the different tools that we use and how we communicate with the public, a brief overview of the 2023 highlights that we've done, some project uh, achievements, and then in 2024, just some of our new direction and project priorities. So the role of corporate communications um, is done by two full-time positions reporting to the director of communications. So we have a communications coordinator, myself, and a visual communications technician, uh, Dallas Gray. Uh, we're responsible for advertising on behalf of Clearwater County. Um, that could include newspaper advertisements, radio ads, uh, posters assisting uh, various departments with their community engagement events, uh, ensuring that our corporate identity and branding is consistent uh, throughout all department programs and services. We also deal with issues management or public relations, so that's depending on um, issues that arise um, that present challenges to us. And then in the event of emergencies, um, our, the communications department acts as information officers um, to assist with information delivery to the public. We look after promotional materials that could be ordering marketing collateral, swag, et cetera. We are in charge of the county social media channels and marketing. We assist departments with special events. We plan and help them plan and support the events. Um, we look after and assisting departments uh, with their strategic communications planning. And then finally, our website, which is our biggest platform of information, external of that website, and then also our internal website for our employees. Uh, the goals outlined in this uh, plan um, start off with, uh, number one, cultivating a well-informed -inform understanding of the general program and services that we offer to residents. Number two is to foster two-way communication, so ensuring that there is um, open channels of communication to and from the public. And then finally, building communications processes, and this involves ensuring that internally we are working efficiently interdepartmentally to ensure that the information we provide to the public is consistent um, and clear to understand. So with the continuation of these goals in mind, so I think I went one slide ahead, sorry. In 2023, one of our biggest achievements was planning and researching our website redesign. Uh, that um, was completed, it took about 12 months um, with the uh, launch of the website redesign happening just last week. It was also the first year that we completed um, full page newspaper ads in the Western Star. It was also the first full year that we did um, quarterly Clearwater County Highlights newsletters instead of six. 
And we've also improved our social media presence with just better improved graphics. We've also strengthened our public awareness on definitions used during emergencies, and this stemmed from the last wildfire season, and we'll continue to do that uh, this year as well. Looking ahead to 2024, we've started uh, doing weekly Did You Know posts to help educate the public about our existing programs and services, as well as legislative and, um, and legal matters. We have also started um, an initiative to create more various video reels for increased engagement, and we're also looking at reformatting council highlights uh, by topic theme so that they're easier to understand for the public. Uh, next, we'll be looking at creating a how to get involved section on our website. This particularly speaks to public participation opportunities. And we'll be also looking at promoting uh, the new website to assist users with the technological access as aspect. Um, over the years, we've gotten a lot of um, questions about where to, where to access certain information, and we've um, realized that that's more of a technical, um, technical barrier that um, we can assist the public with understanding how to use the website better. And then finally, um, another addition to the website that we'll be focusing on this year is improving all the public-facing forms um, so that they're consistent and easier to complete for users. Um, these are all the, all the different tools that we use, that we can utilize uh, for implementing these goals. Uh, they can be from utilizing the local newspapers, radio, newsletter, the TV in the main lobby, or even in the recreation center in the town, uh, news releases, direct mail. Um, they all depend on the project and, and with how much of a reach we want with the public. In terms of how we communicate, we use a, a lot of different channels. Starting off with the website in the top left corner, we've had last year just over 250,000 page visits, which is consistent with previous years. Uh, we also have a mobile app, which is a miniature version of our website. Uh, that has had over 2,300 Android and Apple user downloads. For social media, we have Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. They're all seeing consistent increases of followers each year, which is good evidence that the information we are outputting has value to the public. For YouTube, we have had last year 42 committee and council meetings live streamed and recorded, in addition to 11 other videos that pertain to either tourism, our podcast, um, or any other videos or recordings that we've had for public engagement events. For our Clearwater County podcast, we have had 18 podcasts to date with 320 uh, lifetime listens. And I'll get a little bit more into that in, in the next few slides. Uh, e-news refers to our online subscription for our e-newsletter, so that's anyone that would like to receive uh, a direct email with any updates happening in the community. Um, we just reached over 1,000 registrants. We try to aim for about one to two per month, just so it's not too much in people's inboxes, and it's always based on time sensitivity of projects. <laughs> We also publish in three local newspapers. That's the Western Star, Mountaineer, and Sundry Roundup, depending on the project scope and the areas that we want to reach. We also advertise on, advertise on the local radio stations as needed. And then in the event of emergencies, uh, for, for example, the fire ban signs are posted on the road signages, and we also might utilize posters in the community as well. Our Clearwater County Highlights newsletter, which I'll get into a little bit more detail soon. And then in the event of emergencies, we also utilize the Alberta Emergency uh, Alert app, and finally, we contribute to local publications, such as the town's community guide or the visitor guide um, when needed and as needed. So the Clearwater County Highlights newsletter, um, we, last year was the year, first year we switched from six publications to four. So we aim to have one mail to residents at the end of each quarter. Uh, this gets mailed to approximately 5,200 households. It's a 32-page publication, and this reduction in publications has allowed us to be more cost-efficient and have more staff time to be dedicated to public education and awareness of county programs. For news and public uh, participation projects, uh, the communications team has assisted with three public participation projects, starting off with the amalgamation study last year at the very beginning. Uh, that, then that followed with the Nordegg Cemetery open houses um, in June, and then the amalgamation negotiations uh, near the latter part of, of 2023. In addition, we've also communicated about the newsletter change to residents. We've been doing that throughout the entire year just so that there's no surprises to the community. In addition, there were 11 news releases uh, published as well. For website analytics, I've just shown a small graph from January to June just so that you guys can more easily see the peaks uh, throughout the year. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we've had over 250 page visits last year, 
and um, the server has been updated to a Canadian-based cloud, uh, cloud hosting service to prevent downtime outages. We had one outage last year, um, but that's been um, fixed uh, since, since, since that incident, and this is, uh, this is due to the, to the server being physically located um, in our adjacent province. The most visited pages last year were employment, garbage and recycling, maps, our Clearwater Regional Fire Rescue Services, our Contact Us directory, the property assessment map, land ownership maps, and recreation um, topics such as the Rocky to Nordic Trail. And these changes are based on what season we're in. Uh, they might differ in the beginning part of the year when our employment uh, for seasonal, seasonals is quite high, and then it might uh, change to a different direction as the year progresses. For Instagram, we're promoting more diverse content, uh, adding more video reels. Um, however, it's important to know that we don't overlap content with tourism, and that's to avoid duplication because our David Thompson Country Regional Tourism brand uh, covers that really well on social media. In addition, we've also created icons under the highlight section to better organize the information that we're outputting. So we'll look at uh, continuing to organize the content uh, better and add more, more information to our users and followers. This is by far my favorite slide. Um, I've included three sort of snapshots of our YouTube analytics. So in 2021, we had just over 10,000 views of all of our video content. And the bottom left corner uh, shows a snapshot of 2022. We had just over 14,000. And last year, we had just under 20,000 views of all of our content. That peak that you see around May, or sorry, March, just, just before March 2023, that was due to the public hearing for the Municipal Development Plan. Um, but it shows that there's a lot more access being obtained through YouTube for our video content. For LinkedIn, uh, we are focusing on sharing more employment postings, economic development statistics and resources. For example, our 2023 community profile we shared through LinkedIn, which had quite a bit of traction, and this um, is, has helpful information for investors to better identify if Clearwater County is a potential place where they'd like to invest in. And then finally, uh, a recent change uh, that we started doing near the end of 2023 is sharing more broadband news and information because that's the industry's biggest network. For our Clearwater County podcast, uh, we've only issued two last year, and that was due to staffing capacity and how long it takes to edit, edit videos, but um, it's still, there's a lot of um, education and resources available in the 18 podcasts that we've issued over, over uh, the start of it since 2021. The website redesign, so starting about 12 months ago, uh, we've surveyed staff and the public um, indirectly um, with uh, just getting feedback and we've made notes over the years with what doesn't work for the public, where things are hard to find. We've gathered the information and um, did a miniature version of, of, of a website kind of um, update, but mostly it was a redesign to reformat the menu to be more user focused. We've decluttered information and centralized some other pages. And the overall visual uh, design has been enhanced to match our 2022 brand branding guidelines. For social media, um, with the goal in mind to uh, drive people to our website and to increase that public awareness and, uh, and engagement, uh, we really want to be crisis ready when, uh, while we're building public trust. And the reason for this is because research has shown that people have more confidence in knowing where to go for information during an emergency when you consistently post information and have a well-functioning website. So for Facebook, we'll be adding more consistent uh, content under our event section that's appealing to our audience and more interactive stories to engage people. Uh, we'll be doing the same thing for Instagram, adding more uh, content um, and interactive stories to engage people. Twitter and LinkedIn will be primarily staying status quo, with LinkedIn having more posts on broadband achievements. And then finally for YouTube, um, we'll be trying to engage um, more likes and subscribes so that people are notified when a new council meeting is, is live streamed and, and, and uh, re recorded. So to loop back to the change that's uh, happening um, in the strategic uh, communications plan, we're proposing that the citizen satisfaction survey be moved to, from 2025 to 2024. The goal is to ensure that there's sufficient time for council to review, to review the current satisfaction levels with the community before the next municipal election. The survey would be co-coordinated with the consultant uh, that will be working closely with the communications team. 
And then finally, just some other considerations that we'll be looking for um, this year is uh, we'll be increasing public preparedness education messaging. We'll be keeping up with the changing trends. Um, as many of you are aware, Facebook often has changes and updates, um, whether it's to their rules for posting content or algorithms. Uh, the timing of Instagram posts and when they appear on user feeds always differs uh, based on the current algorithm, algorithms, so we'll be sensitive and, ca and uh, cautious to that. And of course, um, some topics are just more sensitive than others, so we'll be uh, mindful and cognizant of when we're posting and how we're posting the information. We'll be focusing on uh, how we deliver our information so that uh, we can improve how it's, uh, how it's being interpreted, and we'll continue to create more interactive posts to add value to the public. Simplify what and how complex information is shared. And then finally, just expand and improve on our public participation tools. Over the years, we, we've learned a lot from each project about what works for our community and what doesn't. Um, and we'll be using all of that education um, and experience to continue to improve our future projects. Any questions? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Deputy Reeve Melha. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, Great presentation, um, and I actually really like the new website, um, particularly the graphics. I'm, I'm a picture person, so I like that there's there's lots of pictures. Um, have we looked into further, I know that this council's mentioned it a few times, having a survey or an info sheet in the tax notices, because those are already guaranteed mail outs that we have to send out. Um, have we made any progress on actually achieving that? I. We'll defer that to Rick Emmons. Okay. Putting um, a survey or an information sheet in the tax notices. Um, we've mentioned it a few times. I'm curious if we've made any progress on that actually being achieved this year. Um, we do have an information sheet that was circled, circulated out to Council as far as all the data and information. Um, we haven't got a survey of subject matter, okay. but we did utilize um, because you're right, ones it, it's out. going to every household anyway. So we did utilize the opportunity for information to get out to our public as another engagement tool. Um, but at this time, we just we don't have a survey subject matter. Okay, because that went out with the uh, the assessment, like the no. crap. There was two different letter letters that go out now, right? Because there's one that goes out for assessment information, and then one that goes out with tax notices, right? So are you talking about the one that went out with the assessment, like one that went out with assessments? The tax. Okay, maybe I'm confused. Okay, Mr. Hagan. And perhaps just for clarity, and thank you, Reeve, uh, the assessment notices will be going out later this week okay. or early next week. Uh, the insert that is, is going out with those is largely about the change yes. from one notice to two notices, one being assessment, one being taxation. Uh, so we will, as Mr. Edmund said, we will have another opportunity when the tax notices go out in May to include another insert. Um, we have other information that we're trying to include in that insert, and we are fairly limited in, in terms of the space. Uh, I don't know that we'll be able to include a survey in there. Um, also considering that we're looking at doing a formal survey this year as well, this might be an opportunity for future years to kind of fill in gaps when we're not doing a, a formal survey. Perfect. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Graham. I do think I recall us getting an email too yes. about asking and I didn't see any responses. I didn't have any ideas personally so I didn't res respond at that time. Um, I was just going to say I love the Monday, I think it's on Mondays, the did you know that you guys are doing. I think it's so important. There's so much that the county does and people don't Unless it affects you, you don't learn about it. So even the roads, like which ones are provincial versus municipal, and you guys have already done that one. I, I remember seeing it, but I think that's such a, a great thing that you guys are doing, and you guys are doing such a great job. It's, I really feel like you guys have stepped it up, have stepped, raised the bar in the last year. So it's, I think you guys are doing a wonderful job, and you always present so eloquently. So thank you for your presentation and your ladies' hard work. Councillor Lahey. Uh, thank you, and I would certainly echo some of those comments. I, I, I appreciate your presentation and showing how uh, and how we are trying to reach the community with our message. And we've got a, a great, a lot of great audio or visual presentations. I was uh, sitting in the local movie theater the other day and watching some of the the um, highlights of upcoming events and things there. And I know that that particular uh, business offers a period of time where you can 
probably through a fee, put some of that. Is that something we've considered, uh, getting the message out? And the and way I look at that is you've got a repeated captive audience there. Some of, some of what we do requires people to be a little less passive. They have to, they have to go out and seek the information. This one maybe could spur some interest in the great things that are happening or the new things that are happening or the, you know, the great work we've done with uh, audiovisual and then maybe it's an easy to just pass those files and have them reach a, a different audience that isn't necessarily seeking that but would benefit from from knowing where it is and you know I'll have to be fair I think the feedback I get the community really values that um, that business for lack of a better word not to promote a business but it's a way we interact with our community and create functionality and really add to the fabric of life and if we can promote our larger community uh, at the same time I think that maybe has benefit and I would be supportive of something but thank you for the efforts uh, that have been ramped up over the last last little while. It's great. I would concur with all that's being said. I'm as you introduced the the long list of everything that you your a department of two is is supporting the the organization is is um, quite impressive. Um, my question to you is in regards to our highlights. So we've really only started that last year, so we've only had one year of doing a four publishing editions. Uh, so this coming year will be another four. Um, I would be interested, um, because it all has to be done pretty well electronically, is there an opportunity, because it's every four months, is to make that booklet a little smaller and offer a digital version of a one pager just to help eliminate maybe a couple of the pages. You're, you're setting it up anyways, it might be more timely, um, but I don't know if that's been considered in the past or maybe in the future. We, we do offer the newsletter in a digital format and we try to encourage uh, people to access it online. We haven't had a lot of feedback from public asking whether they wanted to stop receiving the paper publication, so we're probably gonna keep it for the next few years. Um, we don't anticipate removing that. Um, we've had a lot of demand from departments to add more content because we've taken away two, two publications in, in the year. Um, it's, it's really difficult and challenging to say no to a department um, when they've relied for a very long time on having 32 pages of, of, um, of content that they can, um, they can contribute to. Right. So I'm just thinking of just an online on online information and maybe it's through, you know, just through the website itself and that is just, you know, April is construction month or whatever else or tax and it's just an online information fact sheet that, you know, maybe your department could, at that department could add to that's not necessarily in a print copy. If timing does work, yeah. we can definitely look into that. Um, one thing that we have not one thing that we have started doing on social media is doing a, this is what's happening this month, similar mm -hmm. to what the province yes. does. Uh, we'll be doing more of that just so it gives people a bigger heads up of, with all the different things that are happening um, in the month ahead. Um, but we can definitely look at doing a monthly monthly um, newsletter that we can um, allow residents to access digitally. And I thank you for bringing that up because I looked at that the other day and I said, bang on, that was yeah. like the month ahead. Yeah. That was excellent. So. Any other comments in regards to the communications, to 2024 communications update? Uh, Deputy Reeve Mel. Uh, thank you, Reeve. I, I love um, Councilor Rahi's suggestion of looking into um, the little clips on the movie theater there. Um, in order to have that looked into, do, do we need a motion to do that, or motion to have information come back to us to do that, or can you go forth and prosper? Just looking for, for process on that. Um, we can we can look into that and get some pricing for it and, and see how we can utilize that for our upcoming projects. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Cermak? On, on your social media, I see you have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and, uh, LinkedIn, and YouTube. How do you decide which goes where in this social media? I see that you have uh, broadband just in LinkedIn. Uh, why not Facebook? We do we do utilize Facebook and, and Twitter for that, but we're noticing that, that that network, the broadband community or industry, utilizes LinkedIn a lot more. Um, it was also based on feedback from the consultants uh, to start utilizing LinkedIn a lot more. Oh, 
So there is some thing to this social media. Yeah. <laughs> I hate social media, so <laughs> I'm learning about it. <laughs> so, so there is some kind of method in your madness why you pick certain ones to go with yes. certain topics. Yes. That's good to hear. Thanks. <laughs> All right, if there's nothing further, looking for a motion. Councillor, okay, Councillor Graham makes the motion to accept the communications update for information as presented and approve the, the plan as amended. All right, any other further questions? I'll call the question of all those in favor. And that is carried. Thank you so much today. And uh, looking at the time, I think we will take a lunch break until 1 p.m.
welcome back. We just finished our lunch break and now we are on, uh, in the agenda, we are on item seven, which is reports. And we will go first to the CAO report. So I'll turn it over to CAO Ammons, please. Thank you, Reeve Swanson. Good afternoon, Council. So the April 9th, 2024 CAO report, uh, the first item is the assessment model review engagement. Based on a plan developed together with municip municipal and industry stakeholders, Municipal Affairs is reinitiating the assessment model review, the AMR, and developing a long-term approach to in keeping the regulated property assessment system updated. Their intention is to ensure that the AMR process is deliberate, evidence-based, and stakeholder-driven from the beginning to the end. The outcome of the review is expected to result in fair evaluation of regulated property for municipalities and regulated property owners. The regulated property is difficult to assign a market value to because it rarely trades on an open market. Municipal Affairs prescribes rates and procedures to assess these types of properties. Regulated property types included in this review are telecoms, pipeline, railway, railway wells, electric power systems, and m and &E. This engagement is in stage two. Foundational policy review, February to December of this year. The AMR process will update Alberta's regular, regulated property assessment system to reflect current construction costs, as well as methods to promote transparency and stability for municipalities and regulated property owners. There is more information available on the attached link. Good, thank you. Any questions for CEO Emmons? Seeing none, looking for a motion to accept the CEO report for information. Thank you, Councillor Cermak. All those in favor? Not carried, thank you. Moving on, we have the verbal council reports. I'll go to Division Two. All right, a fairly short report today. I had my Rocky Library Board meeting. There wasn't really anything extremely substantial to report from that. There's one more showcase cinema. Showcase cinemas, thank you. <laughs> it just left my brain. Um, one more showcase cinema this season, and then they fire up in the fall, I believe, again. So there will be later in the summer or early fall kind of a thing, there'll be the option so people can vote on what they want to see this se next season. So that will be good. Um, the I went to the Rimby RCMP Town Hall as the Rimby RCMP rep from Council. There was a, a presentation. It took me a while to find that darn hall because it's not on Google Maps and I couldn't find it and then I figured out which highway it had to be off of. So I missed the very start of the presentation, but it was similar to what we received. They went at our last meeting, they went a lot more into detail about cybersecurity at it. It was a an older older generation of people at it, so I think that was very beneficial for them. And the part that I found most valuable was the discussion. Um, there was lots of, I think there's been a string of break-ins in the area out there lately for the people that were attending. And so there was a lot of discussion about security systems and they, Sergeant St. Cyr said that if anyone has questions, they give them a call. So I'm sure that would be relevant for our area as well because they also, they also patrol in part of Clearwater County. So, and there were also a lot of questions how RCMP respond to break-in calls and if people should, if it's, say they have two properties and the one that they, they're at their house and their other property is being broken into but they get an alert that it's being broken into whether or not they should go there, which you should not because you don't know if the people have, are armed or what's happening. So there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, I attended, there was an SDAB hearing. I was unable to attend as the chair because I had an appointment that afternoon, but I attended the first hour and a half just to, to listen because it was in my division. So that was, was interesting to listen to. And then yesterday we did our renewable energy policy bylaw and we were all there. So it was a good day. Good job, everyone. Thank and that's you. my report. Thank you. Any questions for Councillor Graham? All right, moving on to Councillor Lai. Uh, thank you very much, Reeve Swanson. Uh, very little to report this time. I just say that I did uh, have an opportunity to um, do my councillor drop-in session. Although our council councillor's room was unavailable, I sat in this very room and was pleasantly surprised that I had visitors for the entire um, session and a little bit longer. And it wasn't even just talking with staff. So I think it was um, time well spent. <laughs> 
and uh, and it actually is kind of um, reaffirming that several people could listen to me yak for almost two hours. So that's uh, that's that's it's nice to know the community still has a tolerance for discussion. So that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Councillor Lyon? All right, uh, go ahead, Deputy Reeve Melfa. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Maybe that means that the drop-in sessions are catching on. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I uh, attended the NSWA, North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance, um, in-person meeting at the Epcor Tower in Edmonton. Um, World Water Day was a huge success, and the heritage, the North Saskatchewan River, Kinesisip, I'm going to butcher that, I apologize. So there's now a Cree name for the North Saskatchewan River. Um, and I'm trying to learn how to say it. I will get better. Uh, but it is now a designated heritage river that ha uh, those that information from the ministers federally and provincially has gone out and it is now officially a heritage river. So thanks to uh, Smoky Lake and the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance for all the work that they've done on that and particularly Kyle Scully has worked, uh, worked a lot on that program. So great work. Um, they're working on creating a natural assets inventory and they have a pilot going with the White Mud and Black Mud Creek areas um, to establish financial value of assets, monitoring systems to detect changes um, in those watersheds and lots of great work happening there. And it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out of how our asset management, um, as far as municipalities um, is concerned and how it can play into this, this work that's being done. Um, the, they're doing a new uh, Indigenous engagement with the NSWA and working very, very hard uh, to uh, develop a collaborative um, framework uh, with different communities um, to establish water monitoring and watershed map mapping within Indigenous communities so that uh, will work within their culture and their specific needs, um, which is really cool. Some great work happening there. Um, and then the GOA did a big uh, update as far as what they're doing to prepare for the drought, uh, et cetera. Um, and I can send that update to you if you if you prefer rather than listening to me ramble uh, about it. <laughs> I have quite a, quite a long update as far as that is concerned. Um, I also am now taking the EOEP finance uh, course and I had, I had part one of that. And one of the most interesting things that they said at that is, is time is council's biggest hurdle. Um, if you count uh, 12, uh, two meetings, um, roughly 12 hours per month, um, we have 576 hours in a four-year term. That's not a lot of time to actually make the impact that a lot of us want to do. And um, I found that very, <laughs> that hit me right here. <laughs> We've got all these big goals, but we have to remember that time is one of our biggest issues and, and that includes our, our administrative time and it's going to be I'm really looking forward to going through this particular this particular course to see where it where it takes me and what all I can learn um, was that the discover rocky app uh, launch um, with with the Reeve uh, and wow what an amazing community that we have um, they did a little taste of rocky with some different restaurants while they were there it was a it, packed house full house it was it was great um, uh, Councillor Radcliffe was able to, to be there as well, and um, it really shows what amazing community stewards that we have, and when they put their minds together, what, what can be accomplished, and I'm looking forward to seeing what, what happens with that particular group. Um, 4-H mini show, I was there as, as a parent, um, but the calves are looking great, so anybody that, uh, that wants to go to the main show and sale in, in Caroline on May 23rd, I encourage you to go there. The show is, all, is during the day, and then uh, the sale happened that night and support one of, one of the amazing youth organizations that we have within this community in the form of, of 4-H. Um, the Ag Spring Fling was that evening as well. Um, the Ag Society did a dinner and dance and, and it was a great opportunity to talk to some of those ag producers. Uh, I also attended the Renewable Energy, energy Workshop uh, with the rest of the team here. So. I, th I think I didn't forget anything. If I did, I apologize. Okay. Any questions for Council uh, for Deputy Reeve Melhoff? Seeing none. Move on to Councillor Northcott. Alrighty, my Councillor report will be short. Uh, attended library meeting at Caroline last night. Mostly consisted of updates and amendments to policies. Um, and I'd also attended a community futures a couple weeks ago. And one of the highlights out of that was uh, 
that over 60% of the RRRF loans were, that was distributed through COVID, about 6% of those have been repaid. So okay. that's really all that I have for the report. Okay, any questions for Councillor Norscott? Okay, seeing none, then we'll go on to Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Eve. <clears throat> Fortunately, my schedule has been a little slower the last couple of weeks. Uh, I've been able to catch up on some other issues. Uh, I did go to the Nordic Community Association uh, meeting in AGM. Um, the big concerns there is fire protection. They, uh, of course, are seeing the same fire risks and to know that their community is at risk. Uh, so there's uh, starting some fire smart work. I believe they got a grant for that. Um, so they're looking at helping themselves as much as they can. Um, and the Nordig Trails group uh, is also starting up for the season. They received a grant for some safety training and, and planning on trails around the uh, hamlet. Um, last Thursday evening, I went to uh, the escape group. This is a group of at-risk kids from the school that um, get together uh, once a week to do some events and um, I, I guess try and change behaviors, create opportunities. Uh, I, I was amazed uh, the activity then was these little microcomputers that you can buy for $35 or something. And uh, they made a, a locator, supposedly, so that you could find someone that was lost in the mountains. Mm -hmm. But then how they jumped into the other capabilities of this device and started making it do more, uh, it was inspiring. And you know, to see the light come on of, of possibility in uh, some of those people. I will try and get there when I can. Um, I also attended the uh, uh, David Thompson and Explore Rocky app at Rival Trade. And uh, yes, there was hardly a place left to park there in that huge lot. So that was um, quite a, a turnout of support. Uh, and, and from all levels of uh, politics as well to support that. So that was terrific. That's all I have. Okay. Any questions for Councillor Rackley? Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Cermak. Thank you, Reeve. Uh, I attended the West Country uh, Stakeholders uh, Day. And they're going to be hosting a spring events day. And it's going to be on the drought. And we have, so far we have a few. The government officials will be giving some speeches and some show on what the government plans on doing, what's going to happen in our area. Um, we haven't set a date for it yet, but it should be fairly soon. Uh, we're, we're, we're hoping to see that uh, come about. Um, right now, drought's pretty in forefront of everybody's mind right now. <clears throat> so it's going to be a great topic. It should be a great day. And then um, last night, I, I attended the uh, Caroline Community Ag Society meeting. Uh, we have got the new tin on the east half of our building out there. It's all red. Uh, they had to replace all of the wood underneath because it was, it was um, not in great shape. So we've had to do that. Looks good. They figure that if the weather holds, they may be done by this Friday with the whole roof. That should extend the life of that building, I would think, by 30 years. Um, and that looks awesome. The, the ends of the buildings already was red, so now it's just going to be the big red building. And then we also voted yesterday. We had an engineer and 
one of the directors from the county, we're out at our meeting, and we are going to be redoing the exits out of our, our uh, ice surface because they, the double doors don't open right, they're wrong, and we need to put in a couple more entrances and some ramps and stuff. That total is about 300,000 um, in our budget early or on when we were in the budget, we approved it. Mm -hmm. um, we approved a little bit more money than that. So we're doing a little bit of savings and we're looking at maybe extending hockey schools maybe a little bit bigger and when the 4-H is in the arena, we're looking at maybe some bull sales along with that and some heifer sales. Um, we had one gentleman in there from the 4-H club and he said he was gonna look into it for us to see if he could get something generated, maybe not this year, but for next year. So it'll help when our ice is out. And um, there was a sad day on March 29th, one of our citizens, good citizen, um, good businessman, a counselor for the Clearwater County, Mr. Marshall Holbrook passed away. Mm. I wanted people to know that. Mm. A very good friend of mine. Mm. Um, he could be a little rough around the edges, and he told you what he thought, which I appreciated. There was no beating around the bush. You knew where you standed with Marshall. Mm -hmm. I got along with him a lot. Fantastic. Um, just a great man. And to close it out, I am a Canadian. I love to live in Alberta. I have chose to live here. But I have a lapel pin on me, Michelle Swanson Buffhead. And it is part of the Ontario Parliament building roof. And I am very proud to have that. Thank you, You're Michelle. Welcome. You're most welcome. Mm -hmm. That's my report. Cool. Thank you. Any questions for Councillor Starbuck? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Ratcliffe. Um, I'm just going to add a question in it to make this a question. But uh, <laughs> I, I certainly have to <laughs> applaud the uh, uh, Caroline Ag Society for the work mm -hmm. they're doing are down there building that community mm -hmm. and uh, working to do more. So uh, my question is, what's next? <laughs> then you don't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is some more on the horizon. There, there, there certainly is. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't do it without this group of people right here. Uh, the Ag Society really appreciates what the county does out there. And I think the administration and our, and our council appreciate what the Ag Society board does there. They're very conscious about the money they spend and they want a good bang for their bucks. Uh, we, we beat projects up pretty bad. We, we go there at five o'clock in the morning and I didn't get home until after nine last night. So we do be, we're like a council here. Uh, I love how we interact with each other and everybody gets thinking outside the box. And that's what I love about down there. I've been involved with the Ag Society down there for I think my first stint on it was in the 80s with the Ag Society in Caroline. Wonderful, wonderful that uh, you have that history to hand with everything. All right, um, so mine's verbal reports can be really cheap, uh, really <laughs> short too, cheap, cheap and short. Uh, I attended the Equus AGM. Um, I was invited, very interesting. They had a full room. They actually do three AGMs. They do a south, a central, and a north. So they have, uh, they've grown. Um, so that was very interesting to listen to them. They, um, 
uh, I also attended the uh, Gilby Pancake Breakfast. One of my neighbors asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, sure. So we went for Pancake Breakfast on the, the Friday, on the Good Friday. So it was very nice to see some of the great pairs out there, too. Uh, that weekend, of course, Easter was nice to re reconnect and have that weekend off. I was glad that we had some nice weather. It worked out good. Uh, the Discover Rocky launch um, attended to that. Uh, their push is it, to become a must-visit destination. And their focus is between 30 and 35 kilometer radius around Rocky, so all the tourism businesses around that. Because, of course, there's the Explore Nordic as well. So this is their launch and a very energetic group of tours tourism operators, including uh, Rival Trade, is involved in that group. And, of course, um, we wish them luck, and it was a very good evening, I have to, I have to say, too, with, with all of us being there. So another bragging point that we have uh, for our area. And also, I had time for four coffee chats with residents over the last couple of weeks, so that was kind of nice, too, to do the one-on-one. -on -one. So didn't have to come in here, but, hey, they supplied the coffee, or I supplied the coffee, and that was good as well. So. Anyways, all good. Uh, so with that, if there's no more discussion, I'll look for a motion to accept the verbal council reports. Okay, Councillor Ratcliffe. All those in favor? And that's carried, thank you. Moving on to the correspondence section. We have uh, four items there. I'm just bringing your attention to item 8.1, which is the letter from the Town of Rocky Mountain House. Um, it is an invitation for us to join the town council at their markets on Maine uh, this coming summer. They've given us some dates, July, uh, June 27th, July, July 11th, August 22nd. If this council is interested in joining and attending them, I think we would need a motion to for councillor attendance. So, okay, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I was lucky enough to attend one of them with them last year, myself and Councillor Lockheed um, did that, and I found it super valuable and a great opportunity to collaborate with the town. Um, I would happily make that motion. Okay. Motion to attend the market on Main. Uh, any discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Um, any other attention? I don't believe there's any other attention. Uh, items up for attention so if we could have a motion to accept correspondence rest of the correspondence for information Kate Councillor Graham thank you all those in favor that's carried so that brings us to section 9 which is our closed session uh, looking for a motion to go into closed session uh, Deputy Reed Melhoff all those in favor and that's carried thank you
<laughs> Welcome back from our closed session. Uh, we do have a, a motion coming out of uh, closed session, and I will turn it over to Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. I, I move that Council endorses the suggested closed session sale prices as recommended for seven residential and two commercial lots in Nordic. Thank you. Any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. And looking at the agenda, we have one last uh, motion of the day, and that is for adjournment. Anybody would like to make adjournment? <laughs> okay. It's a tradition. Okay. So, okay. Councillor Northcutt makes a motion for adjournment. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks.